Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, today is December 1st, 2023. It is uh, a beautiful, cold Colorado morning, uh, and we are meeting at the Colorado Produced Water Consortium uh, for our December meeting. So want to thank everyone for participating today and being willing to jump on virtually and continue the conversations that we've been having over the last few meetings. Um, I think we've got some pretty good information that we're going to hear about today um, that'll help inform us uh, around some of our um, future discussions that we're going to have. Uh, but before we get started, I'm going to do a round of introductions just so that we can tell the world who we are and um, that we're here. So I'm going to call your names as I see you on my screen. Uh, if you just want to quick tell us who you are uh, and who you're representing and what seat you're on on the consortium. Uh, we hopefully this won't take too long. So I'm going to start with Irene. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Irene Andrus, and I'm representing environmental justice for the Sierra Club. And I was appointed by the um, Speaker of the House. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Arthur, you're muted. I'm. I'm Arthur Kepsel. I'm the Environmental Data Group Supervisor with the ECMC, and I'm just here to give a brief update later today. Good to have you here, Arthur. Barbara? Thank you. I'm Barbara Vasquez, holding a seat for uh, grassroots community organization, specifically Western Colorado Alliance. Uh, Joe? You're muted, Joe. I'm Joe Ryan here from University of Colorado Boulder, representing uh, academic uh, interests. Right. Brandy. I'm Brandy Honeycutt with the Water Quality Control Division at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Great. Uh, Eric Anglin. Uh, good morning, Eric Anglin with Occidental Petroleum, serving on one of the seats with the uh, experience and expertise in produced water. Right. Uh, John? John Heil here um, with the ECMC, and I sit on one of the uh, state position seats. Thanks. Sean? Good morning. Uh, Sean Strody, uh, city councilor for the city of Rifle, representing the uh, Western Colorado elected official seat. Good to have you here, Sean. Uh, Jolie? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Jolie Bronner. My pronouns are she and hers. I am the director for the Coalition for a Regenerative Future with the Alliance for Collective Action in Denver, Colorado, and I have been appointed to one of the environmental justice seats. Great. Jacob? Good morning. Jacob Smith with Colorado Communities for Climate Action, local governments. Uh, Emma? Good morning, Emma Pinter, Adams County Commissioner, uh, local government. Uh, Tessa. Good morning, Tessa Sorensen, uh, energy liaison for CDPHE and governing body member of the consortium. Uh, Michalina. Good morning, Michalina Pollock. I'm the executive director for the Energy Council and I'm representing the San Juan Basin industry. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, good morning. Jeff Kirtland with uh, TEP Rocky Mountain, uh, representing industry in the peon space. And thank you. Trisha? Hi, Trisha Pfeiffer. Good morning, everybody. I'm representing the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 8, and I'm one of the federal seats. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Kevin Chan, I will represent uh, DIC and Communities of Color, appointed by the Speaker of the House. Great. Uh, Michael? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Michael Freeman with Earth Justice, and I'm representing one of the uh, conservation NGOCs. James? Uh, James Rosenblum, Colorado School of Mines, representing one of the academic seats. Uh, Grant. Morning, everyone. Grant Tupper from Select Water Solutions, and I'm representing one of the seats for uh, expertise and experience in produced water. 
Ember. Good morning, Ember Michael uh, with Red Willow Production Company with the Southern New Indian Tribe, and I am representing disproportionate communities. Casey. Casey Kozlov, Colorado State Engineer's Office and Governing Body Member. Thanks. Um, give me a second here. I had to switch screens. Doug. Good morning, Doug White, NGL Water Solutions, uh, joining the panel as a produced water expert. Peter. Hi, I'm Peter McMahon with the U.S. Geological Survey. I have been appointed to one of the federal government seats. Great. Uh, Chloe. Uh, Chloe Danforth with the Health Effects Institute, uh, representing one of the nonprofit seats. Uh, Clay? Uh, Clay Terry, uh, Natural Resource Advisors and Energy Consult Development Consultant, and I'm representing one of the seats uh, relative to experience uh, in using produced water. Nikki? Hi, good morning. I'm Nikki Wills, Black Parent United Foundation. I'm representing a nonprofit seat. Zahi? Um, Zahi Kath uh, with Colorado School of Mines representing Academia. Uh, Harmony? I see that you are there, Harmony. Maybe you stepped away for a second. We'll go to Mark Hefta. Hey, thanks. Uh, Mark Hefta, uh, water engineer with Chevron, and I'm representing one of the industry seats. Uh, DJ Basin. Thanks. Great. Uh, there's Harmony. Hi, Harmony Cummings, the Greenhouse Connection Center, representing an environmental seat. Great. Did I miss anyone that's here? Let's just look and see if anyone that is on the panel is in the participants list. I think we're good. So. Welcome everyone, uh, welcome to the public that's joining us today. Um, just a quick overview of what we've got uh, in front of us today. So um, let me pull up the agenda quick. Um, I know it's here somewhere, sorry. So we're gonna start out today uh, with just some general housekeeping and some uh, some introductions on what we're going to be doing. Um, we'll have opportunities for some public comment today. We have one written public comment that I think folks have received via email. We'll acknowledge that written public comment. I'm sure everyone's had an opportunity to look at that. And then I think we've got one person who signed up for oral public comment. And so we'll allow that person to share their thoughts. Um, Hope's gonna give us a review of the draft strategic plan that we've been working on the last couple of meetings, and then talk a little bit about um, next steps or steps that are being taken currently uh, around the uh, initial legislative deliverable one. Um, and then later on in the meeting, we're gonna hear from Trish Pfeiffer, Tessa Sorensen, and John Heil to talk a little bit about um, how produced water is currently regulated um, and current practices um, from the EPA, from CDPHE, and from ECMC. The goal of that ultimately is to just give us a baseline of what current regulations are in place, how different state and federal agencies are currently regulating produced water, and how they're currently working together you know, to, to manage produced water in the state that ultimately will help inform us for some future conversations that we're gonna have very soon around um, state and federal regulatory um, cooperation um, and some of the um, discussions that we're gonna have to have as far as being able to um, meet deliverable to as part of the legislation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I know that we did an initial meeting virtually, um, and this will be the second time we've done, I think, an all virtual meeting. 
um, it is, we've got a lot of people in the room and we've got a lot of folks that are, are going to want to be able to participate. We certainly want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to share their thoughts and we're, and we're able to engage in a conversation um, throughout the meeting. Um, the way that we'll best be able to do that is if folks have um, something to say it's to raise your hand um, virtually in the Zoom meeting. I'll call on people as I see them. Uh, to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, as far as the utilization of the chat function, we're going to discourage the utilization of the chat function unless you're um, unless you're sharing links or specific information that needs to be visible by both consortium members as well as members of the public. Um, and so anytime we utilize chat, we make sure that everyone in the meeting, including the public, are able to see um, what is being chatted, and that should specifically be links um, or specific information uh, that, that folks need to be able to see and to be able to access. Otherwise, just raise your hand and we can make sure that we're transparent in the conversations that we're having during the meeting. Um, I'll do my best to see everyone, um, but um, uh, give me a little grace if I'm if I'm missing folks because I'll be working through a couple of different screens here in order to be able to see everyone. Um, with that, uh, excited that everyone's here, excited that everyone's still willing to engage and participate in the conversations that we're having here. Um, really proud of the work we've done over the last couple of weeks. I know that it was, it, it maybe felt rushed and that uh, some of the conversations that we could have had during that strategic planning session had to be shorter uh, in order to be able to get the, um, the, the framework of our strategic plan uh, accomplished. Uh, but I think we've done a really good job, uh, really proud of the folks that, uh, that engaged in that process and, and really proud of the uh, product that we developed as part of that. And so I wanna just thank everyone for that. And looking forward to continue on working on that and starting to apply some of those strategic planning priorities and, and objectives to some of the work that we're doing now uh, uh, over the next few meetings. And so with that, i uh, love to kick it over to Hope, who's going to talk to us a little bit about some announcements, some of the work that she's doing, and some general housekeeping stuff. Thank you, Chair Messner. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody uh, attending, and I echo Chair Messner's sentiment of appreciation for your engagement and um, significant contributions to the strategic plan, which we'll hear about later today. For the public, um, you should be able to, to uh, turn on the captions. It's at the bottom of your screen. There might be an icon or there's a more. And when you check the more, if you click on the more, then you can have uh, access to the captions. For consortium members, if you're new to Zoom, um, that's the same way you access raise your hand. And um, as a reminder, if you could state your name before you speak, that will help people who are listening today and may not be able to see your name on the screen. Uh, thank you for everyone for using your camera. Uh, cameras, when you're speaking, cameras allow people to see facial expressions and uh, lip reading for those who are deaf or hard of hearing. And then a reminder to take space and make space. If you're someone who speaks in meetings regularly, allow others the opportunity to speak before you do. If you're someone who is normally quiet in meetings, feel free to share your thoughts and your questions. Uh, the goal is for all consortium members to have the same opportunity to speak. So that's my housekeeping. Now on to announcements. Um, I'm very excited to say, to share that we have a new expense form. And I'm going to try to share my screen. I'm, I'm not always, um, Zoom is new to me. So thank you for your grace as I figure out how to share my screen. Um, or maybe, oh, there it is, share screen. And then let's find this. 
very hard. Okay. And John, I even practiced, and I still am having trouble. <laughs> so. so I don't, I don't see it. Uh... <sighs> Okay, well, now do you come. see um, yes. the form? Yes, we see. yes. So this is the new expense uh, reimbursement form. We'll be using this for our virtual meetings. I expect that we'll be um, virtual most of our meetings in 2024. So on the form, it, it will be provided to you by PDF as well as this Excel sheet. You'll put your email here. Um, in row four, you'll put your name in row six. You'll put today's date or the date of the meeting. Um, the stipend amount is $50 for most of you. A few of you uh, do get the additional 150, so you'll change that amount. Then um, I'm, I am really happy that accounting has said we no longer have to physically sign the forms. Um, you can type in your signature here and then date it. And then you'll email it back to me. The email is, is showcasing that you, this is coming from you and not someone else. Um, so any questions on the new expense form? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Excellent. And I'd like to have um, just, a, I wanted to update you. We still have a vacant seat on the consortium. That vacant seat was left by Mackenzie Smith, who worked at Evergreen Natural Resources in the Raton Oil and Gas Basin. The governing body did receive a few applications to fill that seat. N none of those applications or from people working in the Raton Basin. So we have extended the application deadline. So if you do know someone, please encourage them to apply or to contact me or Chair Messner to learn more about the consortium and the time commitments and things that would be expected of that person. Speaking of recruitment, um, I announced at our last meeting that we're recruiting for an environmental protection specialist, a data manager, and assistant director for research. We, um, as you might expect, we did not receive a ton of applications over the Thanksgiving holiday. So we have extended it for two weeks until December 6th. I will be posting this on LinkedIn. So if you find me and uh, you can repost or share, that would be fantastic. If you know people that that would be a great addition to our team, please make that personal phone call and encourage them to apply. I would really like to see a robust group of people apply for these positions. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, seeing none, um, you can always email me for more information. I did want to tell you that the new Mexico Produced Water Research Consortium reached out to me and they contacted me in the spirit of cooperation and coordinated communication between our states on matters that impact specifically the Raton and San Juan oil and gas basins. Those basins are geographically located in both Colorado and New Mexico. And um, the director requested that the Colorado Produced Water Consortium review the New Mexico Environmental Depart Department's proposed supplemental requirements for water reuse. This was specific to produced water. I worked with the governing body and submitted comments that were generally supportive of New Mexico's goals without making any specific policy recommendations. Again, speaking of the New Mexico Produced Water Re Research Consortium, I will be attending their annual meeting December 13th and 14th. I'll be there to learn and to network and to informally share 
what we are doing here in Colorado. And I think that's all I have, um, Chair Messner. Great, thanks Hope. Anyone have uh, questions for Hope before we move on to public comment? I don't see anyone raising their hand, so you must have done a good job, Hope. Uh, I think do want to make sure that folks are aware of the positions that are available, both on the consortium as well as staff positions that would support the consortium. And I know that lots of folks here are networked um, with different people that may have expertise and experience in these areas. And so would certainly encourage folks to um, take a look at those positions and encourage folks that you think may be good fits to apply. Um, so I'd like to re-emphasize that. Um, so I think next on the agenda, we're going to talk, uh, we're, we're going to hear from a member of the public that's asked to present. And so I believe Christine Spansky, and I apologize if I butchered your last name, uh, from Karis uh, has asked to provide public comment. And so if we could elevate her, that would be great. Good morning. You actually said my name just about right, so I can't complain there. It made me reboot the system when I changed statuses. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to comment here, um, Director Dalden, Chair Messner, esteemed consortium members. This is a really extremely important topic on my book. Um, I've been working around it for over 15 years, nearly 20, and it still holds a place in my heart. I'm still very intrigued by it. So I work for Keras Operating. We've been active in the Peon space and for over a decade. Near seven years ago, Keras acquired assets that incorporated several centralized ENP water treatment facilities and hundreds of miles of produced water pipelines into its organization. While predecessor companies had been recycling for years, Keras immediately changed its operational program to maximize the use of produced water in the Peon space and completions operations. While Keras has a significant surface water rights portfolio, generally that water is only used for smaller operations that require freshwater use, such as construction, drilling, or dust suppression. Typically, our teams forecast water movement in the system to maximize the use of produced water, utilizing storage in tanks or permitted ponds at centralized ENP facilities. Numerous times in the course of my career, I've seen completion schedules adjusted to allow for additional fill time in these storage basins to minimize the need to bring fresh water into the system for those completion operations. In most of our operations, Keras has consistently used 100% recycled water without bringing any fresh water into the system to supplement. That said, a system can't ever be truly close to 100% recycled water without being able to permit large tanks or ponds for storage. Water is unable to be produced or treated fast enough on the fly. Hence, produced water storage is critical to a robust recycling program. Ponds for produced water storage are not taken lightly by industry. They're extensively engineered double line ponds with tools for leak detection and wildlife protection. At each of its major water facilities, natural gas is removed from the water, minimizing pond emissions, and then Keras treats the water for removal of solids and hydrocarbons prior to storing water in the ponds. As this consortium works to fully understand and consider the use and strategy of produced water in Colorado, it is imperative that companies that are already doing the right thing are not reproved for activities in basins that operate very differently. Each basin has its own specific challenges and needs, and future considerations to regulations should reflect these. Please take this into consideration as you work through this process. One additional point I would like to make that can't be overstated is the care that my field-based colleagues have for the areas in which our company operates. They live, play, work, and raise families in these areas, and they take pride in their jobs and in doing the right thing each and every day. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide these comments. Thank you for taking some time this morning to provide comments. Um, certainly a good perspective, I think, on some of the work that we'll be continuing to do. And, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll just comment that um, there'll, there, there'll be additional opportunities, particularly over the next few months as we start to dive into some of the basin specific recommendations or considerations um, for you know, additional input and public comment. And at that time, certainly would encourage Keras and other operators in the different basins uh, to, to reach out and um, 
I think there'll there'll be opportunities to present on what currently is happening and then to be able to present on some of the other topics as well. And that's true of any member of the public that has interest in participating, um, you know, in our in our processes. But um, but I think uh, you bring a voice that certainly um, that's certainly we need to hear from the Peons Basin. And so appreciate you taking some time today to share your thoughts. So. Um, Thank you. Hope I don't think we had anyone else sign up for public comment, did we? I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, so we do need to acknowledge that we received written comment uh, from Sandy right. Forthick, citizens for Guelphano County. All of the this written comment was provided to the consortium members prior to the meeting. Great, thanks for that. Uh, so next on the agenda is gonna be a review of the draft strategic plan. Um, I do I do wanna note that, um, because I forgot to at the beginning of the meeting, but the, I, I'm adding something to the agenda at the very end where I, I do wanna take some time and I wanna talk about next steps, <clears throat> You know what we wanna see over the next few meetings um, what are some of the topics that we want to start doing sooner than later as per our strategic plan and the deliverables associated with legislation and just have a conversation about next steps. And so uh, while you're not, you don't see that on the agenda, that's certainly the intent at the end of the meeting after we hear from folks today um, to, to have that conversation. So um, with that, uh, unless there's any questions or comments, I'm going to kick it back over to Hope to share the draft strategic plan. Oh, Clay, did you have a question? <clears throat> Not so much a question, John. Thanks for uh, acknowledging me and Clay Terry. Um, I, I found that comment from Christine very pertinent and uh, I think uh, very valid. And what I just wanted to say to the rest of the group is I think it's critical that we not only encourage mm -hmm. that kind of participation, but we use it as an opportunity to learn you clearly, John indicated, we're gonna be looking and looking for and addressing comments uh, about how things are currently done and what, <clears throat> as we look at uh, additional research and additional practice relative to the to promoting the use of, uh, of produced water. But I, I just think it's really critical and worth comment to say, it, it, it's a good opportunity for those who are participating and current use to be able to explain to the rest of the consortium and educate the rest of the consortium about uh, not only current practice, but possible ways of improving what, are, what we may be currently facing as, as, a, as pathways forward. So I, I just wanted to, to throw that out there to endorse what, what you, uh, to echo what you said and endorse a, a, a very robust utilization of those kinds of comments and suggestions uh, for educational purposes within the context of the consortium. No, I appreciate that, Clay, and I actually think that that segues pretty well into kind of reviewing our strategic plan. And I think as as we review it, you'll be able to, you know, we'll we'll be reminded that we do have some deliverables associated with um, kind of reporting on current reuse and recycling in the different basins and what's currently happening, kind of current state. I think that's a great opportunity for different operators, uh, groups, uh, and folks involved with Produce Water to be able to share what's currently happening. That is one of the deliverables that we'll have to um, address. And then the second one is recommendations for, um, you know, infrastructure, technology, or ideas on how to, you know, increase the amount of reuse and recycling um, in different basins. And so uh, I think your comments are on point and certainly part of the strategic plan that we have and the deliverables associated with the legislation. So um, with that, we'll kick it over to Hope and she can kind of remind us what's on our plate. Thank you. Uh, so Jenny is presenting for me now. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, I am going to take a little liberty here and adjust the, the agenda slightly. I'm going to combine the discussion of the strategic plan 
with the discussion on progress for deliverable one. Uh, next slide. As we, as a review, our strategic priorities include implementing legislative requirements. I renamed this, it used to be called legislation. It got a little confusing with uh, strategic priority number five. So I renamed strategic priority number one, implementing legislative requirements. That will be the focus of 2024. The next strategic priorities are not in any kind of order, but those will be this, the priorities for um, years two, three, four, and five. And our other strategic priorities include education, communities and environment, research, and then identifying regulatory and policy recommendations. And I changed this, it used to be regulatory and policy. We also identified strategic results or goals for each of these strategic priorities, with the exception of the first strategic priority, implementing legislative requirements, a date placeholder was put into the strategic plan. So when you review this draft strategic plan, you'll see by date. And that's being used for each of the strategic goals. Once the implementation plan is completed, these dates will be entered. I'll be working on the implementation plan and hope to present something for your reaction in January or February. Again, as a reminder, the strategic plan is designed to be implemented in years two, three, four, and five. Year one of the consortium is designated to operational tasks, such as setting up the consortium and meeting our legislative requirements. Next slide. House Bill 23-1242 requires the consortium to develop, analyze, report, and recommend on nine deliverables these deliverables, um, the due dates for these deliverables are beginning March 1st of 2024, with the last deliverable due on July 1st, 2025. Of the nine, I'd like to highlight three of the deliverables that we are currently working on. Next slide. Deliverable A1, develop guidance documents and case studies. By March 1st, 2024, the consortium will develop guidance documents and case studies to promote best practices for in-field reuse and recycling. You'll find this strategic result in our draft plan. And I do want to point out the focus is on in-field reuse and recycling. We have begun work on this deliverable. Even before our first meeting, several of you have shared guidance documents and case studies with Commissioner Messner and with me. Although the timeline um, given in, I apologize, <laughs> uh, we will be collecting documents, best practices, and case studies on a continuous basis, and we will have presentations at our meetings about what industry is using for in-field reuse and recycling now, what's being piloted, and what barriers um, might exist. By our February meeting, I hope to have something for you to react to as far as a structure for what this will look, what the deliverable will look like. From now until our meeting, I'll be working on reviewing and evaluating the resources that the consortium members have been sharing. And um, the format might be a formal report, something like a literature review, an online library, or a combination of those formats. I do want to take time to thank those of you who have been sharing these documents with me, I encourage you to continue to share. And even though there is a deadline uh, for this deliverable, this is something the consortium will be continuing to collect all of the time. Next slide. Deliverable A2, recommending 
recommendations to coordinate regulatory policies. By May 1, 2024, the consortium will develop recommendations on how state and federal agencies can better coordinate regulatory policies related to produced water. This is a very tall ask, and we have started working on this. At today's meeting, we will hear from three regulatory agencies. This is knowledge building. This is a knowledge building activity, and it's the starting point from which we will be developing our recommendations, and we will continue building our knowledge through March. And really, it's specific to this legislative deliverable in our education strategic priority, we will continue that knowledge building uh, for the consortium. Beginning in 2024, we will continue our work with federal and state partners to identify gaps and opportunities, as well as explore potential barriers to our coordination efforts. By April, I hope to have a draft recommendation prepared for the consortium and the public for feedback. I'll incorporate the feedback into a final draft that will be shared with the internal reviewers at the Department of Natural Resources. By May, we are hoping to offer the Energy and Carbon Management Commission a presentation about these recommendations. So, next slide. Deliverable A6, develop priority topics. I am excited to report on this one because the due date is September 1st, 2024, but the consortium's already made significant strides towards achieving this. So the deliverable is by September 1st, 2024, the consortium will highlight and develop topics related to produced water that we want to work on as a consortium. As I said, we made significant strides towards this deliverable by creating our strategic plan. I hope that we can finalize that strategic plan at our January meeting. Um, the progress that we did to as a review for the public is that at our last two meetings, we developed our strategic priorities and strategic results um, or goals for each of those priorities. The draft strategic plan is being presented today. It's also on the consortium's website for your reaction and your feedback. Over the next month, I plan to develop the milestones and action steps for each strategic results that will be captured in the implementation plan. Throughout the year, we'll be reviewing our progress, our accomplishments, and any um, opportunities for us to work best together. During the summer, I am hoping that we'll identify our priorities and approaches to successfully completing all nine deliverables as specified in the legislation, and then discussing the following uh, calendar years and our priorities for those calendar years. Next slide. So the key takeaways that I, I want to impress on you is we know our work priorities for 2024. They are operational and legislative. We have made important progress since our first meeting. I'm really impressed with everybody's active participation and, um, and I really just wanna celebrate how much progress we've made in a short amount of time and we continue to move forward. Uh, now, if it's okay with you, Chair Messner, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do folks have any questions with what uh, Hope has presented here this morning? Comments, questions, thoughts? Michalina? 
Um, you know, just reviewing Hope's timeline. I just, um, I know what you guys are trying to recruit and in the process for an industry stakeholder for the Raton Basin. <clears throat> but I just feel as we're moving so quickly, um, I think industry representation is being remiss slightly. And just if there's thoughts around that. I'm happy to give you my thoughts around that. I mean, uh, I think that uh, I think that the legislation is clear that the industry seat has to have experience um, from the Raton Basin, and so currently we haven't had an opportunity to um, find someone that has that experience in the Raton Basin. Even though we've had some folks with certainly produced water experience or industry experience that have applied, but um, I'll also note that this was something that that COGA and API encouraged to be included in the bill was specific representation from the different basins um, as a requirement for consortium membership. And so, um, so I do think we have to follow uh, the letter of the legislation as far as trying to find um, industry representation, representation from the Raton Basin. So uh, with that, if you know folks that, um, have experience in the Raton Basin and are willing to participate, we certainly encourage them to apply. Um, we've had the application open and if we can find someone with that experience or in willingness, and it's not for lack of trying, I've certainly reached out to a number of folks that I know in that area uh, to see if they have interest, um, <clears throat> but haven't haven't had any success yet, so. Other thoughts or questions? Well, Hope, I really appreciate the work that you've done on that um, to kind of line it out and to make it clear some of the work that we've got in front of us. Um, and the structure I think you put together is a successful structure. I, I want to talk just a little bit about that and get folks' thoughts because one of the, I think as you look at Hope's timelines there, um, one of the things that that Hope and I have talked about at least is, you know, how do we structure this so that it is that we're allowing opportunities for the work to progress on the different legislative deliverables that are associated with the work we're gonna do in 2024 and still allow you know, input and conversations to happen within the consortium, um, ideas that are being provided by consortium members incorporated in some of the deliverables that will be happening, uh, but still allow for efficiency's sake and because the timeline is so tight on some of these things, how do we, um, between meetings, develop enough information that enables the consortium to be able to react to something um, during the meetings themselves? And so conceptually, from a framework um, standpoint, what we talked about, and I'm happy to hear folks' thoughts on that, is to have, you know, depending on what the deliverable is and depending on what the time frame is, you know, introduce that that topic or that deliverable that's in the legislation and our strategic plan at, at a meeting, get some initial thoughts and feedback on direction and paths forward for that deliverable from the consortium and kind of identify information that needs to be developed, education that needs to occur, outreach that needs to happen, whatever those pieces are for the particular deliverable, get that, that feedback from the consortium have hope, you know, take that feedback and start to develop some structure around what needs to happen with that deliverable, whether that's, you know, a white paper, a literature review, a report, um, educational presentations, whatever that looks like, but that gives her direction to work between meetings in order to be able to develop that structure or that, um, that work product that will give the consortium members an opportunity to react to and then at the next meeting or meetings, um, be able to present that to consortium members for review and for reactions in a draft format that will continue to evolve that through our discussions and, and through our input to come up with a final product that we can all agree on prior to um, the deliverable dates associated with the legislation. Um, some of those timelines will be, you know, a couple of meetings, some of those timelines may be three or four meetings, depending on what the topic is. 
Um, but that's that's kind of how I was thinking about it structurally. I'm happy to hear any thoughts or feedback on that, but I thought that may continue us moving down the path in a pace that we'll need to have in order to be able to accomplish the deliverables within 2024, but still allow for plenty of input and feedback from consortium members. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? Does that seem like a good idea? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Great. Uh, Harmony? I just want to add that for some of us, this isn't always the easiest format to participate in. There, um, and so when we talk about white papers and things that are incredibly technical, I think there needs to be a way to also bring that down so that this wide group of folks can participate in a meaningful way. Um, I know for me, being a single mom, uh, sitting down and reading a bunch of papers isn't always what works best in our wheelhouse, but maybe there's some people in the consortium who, and maybe this comes back to you, Commissioner Mesner, or to Hope, to take that information and maybe do a video presentation on that, something that we can listen to. Um, maybe there's some slides associated with that, that before we get to the actual meeting itself, that we have a little bit of a preview of what's coming, um, of what the major ideas are so that we don't, aren't hearing about things and topics and concepts for the very first time in the meeting itself. No, I think that's, I think that's fair. That's a good suggestion. And I think that's something that we can like internalize and think about how to best do that. I mean, I, I agree um, that having, you know, you know, some information teed up prior to even having a brainstorm on a particular topic is going to be important. And I think we can do that in a, in a number of different ways prior to that meeting. And, you know, I certainly think that all of us can look at our strategic plan and the deliverables and, you know, look forward to some of the things that we'll have to accomplish and um, certainly provide thoughts on ways to best get information to consortium members or what information you feel like you need to need, you, you will need in order to be able to start to have discussions around, you know, even brainstorming um, what the direction may be to hope. And so, um, so I, I think that's a good suggestion. And I, and, and I think these meetings are a really good opportunity for that, right? And so I think as we look at it, we know that in March, we've got a deliverable um, like Hope talked about to, um, you know, develop guidance documents and case studies um, to promote best practices for infield reuse and recycling. You know, if if you've got questions or you or you, you know, need additional information on that in order to be able to provide more information about that, I think these meetings are a great opportunity to share your thoughts on that. I think Hope's reached out via email to everyone on the consortium and asked for input on that particular topic. I think it's important that the different members of the consortium, you know, look at that and try to decide if there's information that you have or contacts that you have that may be able to provide information to start to develop a library for a literature review on that particular topic. Um, and then perhaps future presentations on that topic. Um, you know, I think the next one, coordinating state and federal regulatory policies, you know, I think, again, I think we're starting to take a crack on that right now by getting some baseline information from our state and federal agency partners in this um, to hopefully generate enough information for folks to be able to ask questions on what are the next things that we need to know about or what are the questions that you still have that we can start to figure out in future meetings. So I feel like I'm rambling here a little bit, but I think it was a good suggestion, Harmony. Uh, Trisha? Hey, Commissioner. Yeah, I think I may say the same thing you're going to, that you were alluding to, but um, maybe if we're going to have a brainstorming session on a particular topic, having like a 15 minute presentation, kind of an intro to the topic that summarizes the literature and, you know, we could get help from academia side of the house, maybe on that, <laughs> if it's, if it's in their wheelhouse, 
And then that way we're all on the same page before we start brainstorming. I think that's, I think that's kind of the same thing you were saying, but. No, you said everything. it a lot better than I did. <laughs> uh, Ember? Good morning, Ember Michael. I was wondering if we already had a matrix that outlines our state and federal partners, or is that within some of the um, documents that have already been uploaded to the SharePoint? I don't know as we have, I don't know as we've developed a matrix. I think you'll hear from Tessa today that there was a, a roadmap that was developed that I think does a good job of highlighting the different responsibilities around produce water between ECMC and CDPHE, but I don't know as the federal government got rolled into that. And so I think that's certainly something to consider as a as a as a work product that we could develop is a development of a matrix or a roadmap like that. Thank you, and I'm sure Tessa's thing will um will be insightful. It was just nice to see how all the dots are connected. Sure, no, I Thank agree. You. Yeah, I saw Jolie's hand up, but it went down. What are you up or down? I'm down. It was a. Uh volunteer I can send via email but now that I'm talking I'll just say I want to volunteer during my day job a lot of times I work in accessibility and how we make um, reading levels more accessible um, translating from legalese or bureaucratic language to community language I've also utilized some AI to support with this so I'd love to be a thought partner on how we make everything more accessible so I just wanted to volunteer um, how I could help with that that's something I'd love to support equality is not the same as equity and so we can do a little more work to make sure everyone can access things fairly so thank you I think that's great great suggestion any other thoughts before we move on Okay, um, so now it's gonna take me five minutes to find the agenda again, uh, one moment. Okay, uh, so next on the agenda, I hope are you, you're done with the legislative deliverable one too. You combine those two things, is that right? I did, and so we saved a little time. So um, the next, we're transitioning to the presentation portion of okay. this, uh, this meeting, one thing that I did hear you say, Chair Messner, is um, to get feedback on the structure for the case studies. Do you want to take time for that now, or if we can discuss that in January um, and take a break now and start the presentations after the break? Well, Maybe maybe I'll open it up and just say, you know, we've got this deliverable, we've got case studies, we've got um, guidance documents that we're trying to compile in order to be able to do a literature review um, to be able to evolve that into something that's digestible, both to the consortium, the legislators, um, and the public. Do folks have ideas or 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 or, or um, thoughts on? information that needs to be provided on that. I think, hope we've already received quite a bit of information from some of the industry partners, but are, are there some other um, resources that may be available out there that folks wanna just talk about here quick so that um, we make sure that we're soliciting the best information for that deliverable. I can also put a pin in that, folks can think about it and we can wrap it up or bring it back at the end of the meeting as well. But Commissioner Pinter has her hand up. Yes, um, I apologize, uh, Emma Pinter, Adams County, uh, for calling out a fellow consortium member. Um, but we have several academics in the room. And if we've been receiving um, a bunch of information from industry, that's great. But um, I myself am not an academic and don't, um, study environmentalism for a living, but would be curious if any of those from um, our universities have any research studies or materials that they would like to flag for us to be included in the body of things we're considering. I think that Hope collected some and posted it uh, on, the, on the website. So we'll be happy to put more, uh, you know, of all the studies that's at least done in Colorado, but from other places too. 
Yeah, yeah I think we we threw up the at five or six, and then I know the roadmap went up from um, the, uh, the industrial water roadmap, but at least there's five or six studies that are very relevant to Colorado that are up that I know Hope put up that we provided. That would be great. And that begins to answer my question. I just, when I hear that the preponderance of information provided has come from one sector, it raises curiosity for me if academia has more to offer. Um, and a similar question, um, possibly for the EPA and for our federal partners, if there are any studies from a national perspective in other regions that would be necessary or at least informative for us to be made aware of, I would be really interested in having that included in the body of research available. Yeah, I think that's good. And I and Commissioner, I, I wanna I maybe misspoke and we're maybe talking about two different things here as well. So I mean, one is um, you know, I think that there was a general request for information to include in the library from the consortium to be able to give members of the consortium as much background information as possible on a on a wide range of topics associated with produced water. So any anything involving produced water that could be helpful for us to have information on. I think Hope's been compiling in a library that's available on the website. Then there's the 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 the, the deliverable itself, which is asking for specific case studies or best management practices or guidance documents associated with in-field recycling. Um, and so while the produced water library may have considerably more information on produced water generally, um, this is going to be more specific on infield because a lot of the information that gets provided to put in the library may talk about beneficial use of produced water outside the oil field or things like that, whereas this one's going to be specific on what's currently happening to reuse and recycling, to reuse and recycle produced water inside oil and gas operations. And so I hope that makes sense. And I didn't want to indicate that industry was the only one providing information on either of those topics, because I don't think that's the case. Uh, Brandy? This is probably an intuitive suggestion that you guys have already thought about or someone has, but as we build this library, I think it would be good as we delve into the different topics to sort of separate them out, you know, and have classifications of the type of information so that sure. it's just organized. I don't, I, I'm sure you guys already thought of that, but. Well, I haven't, but uh, I'm sure Hope did. Uh, Mr. Pinter. Oh, okay. Um, Irene? Um, yeah, I know that um, we do have a good study on on uh, the DJ. I don't think we have a study on best practices for every basin. So I think good, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be good to get some information on some of the base because the recommendations could be very specific per basin. I think that's right. And I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah. And I, and I would chime in that at one point there was a paper a few years ago where they just took the number of publications based on location basins. And it was something like the Marcellus has the most out in the Northeast has the most academic papers published, followed by the DJ, mostly from a study that Joe Ryan or uh, from a grant Joe Ryan was able to get Zahi, myself and others were on the DJ basins next. Then after that basin, it's down in Texas. So there's very little research on each basin. It's very selective to specific basins and where universities had money to study that water. Um, but there are a bunch of review papers on potential treatment technologies at different TDS levels. So I, we can kind of scrounge that we can pull those together and put those up there. But there's I, I can't speak to and maybe Zahi or others that maybe have been in a little longer know about other parts in Colorado. But it's very specific and the, the literature is, is, is sparse when it comes to some of these other basins. Point. Any other thoughts on this? Trisha. Yep, I'm sorry, I didn't say who I was from before the EPA. I think in looking at best management practices, isn't that something that we could get from um, ECMC 
because they're going to have different requirements in different fields because of different issues they've run into. So I wonder if they have information that would be um, useful too. Just, a, just a thought. Yeah, I think so, and I think that's certainly one of the intents is to get the the existing guidance documents and maybe recommendations for best management practices from ECMC, which are currently available uh, as uh, as part of that information that would be provided for that deliverable. So, um, but but appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Commissioner Messner, Hope Dalton, Director. Uh, so what I'm hearing from this discussion is uh, we want a library of documents that is available online. And um, just to be clear for the public that is attending today, the library is not currently online. Um, it Whoops. is available in a shared folder that consortium members have access to. We intend to review all of the documents for relevancy and credibility prior to just putting them online for the public. So we're in that review process right now. The second thing that I'm hearing, um, thank you, Brandy, for mentioning organization because that was a question that I had and what I'm hearing is organizing the information by basin would be useful. Um, did I get everything? I'm seeing some nods. I think that's right. Yeah, uh, we've got two harmony. Why don't you go first? Can we also maybe make a note on each document or whatnot of who is the person who submitted it so that we have context if this was an academia, if this was an industry, if this was an environmental perspective, I'm sure on a lot of them we'd be able to tell, but I think that that's helpful and in, in, in with transparency. Does it, folks have thoughts on that? I do, well, Commissioner Messner, um, yeah, Hope Dalton, Director. So Harmony, it's an interesting idea. We haven't been collecting that information and some of that information was collected prior to my joining. And so I'm not sure I could provide that information. The other thing that I've been kind of thinking about is if we, is ownership of, of the papers. So. Someone mentioned ECMC. ECMC has been, in my opinion, a massive library of papers. And so we could refer to them. And um, and then really, once we get the papers evaluated specific to the deliverable of infield of reuse and recycling, then we could highlight those resources. But again, we haven't been begun on that evaluation. Commissioner Pinter. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I understand the internal review process. I think it would be really helpful um, to see, like just like all of our records and you've all ad admonished us repeatedly that all of our records and our notes and our chats are public. Just knowing where documents came from would be really helpful. Thank you. Good oh, and then I, I, and I did have, I did have one question, like when we're making that library available, um, when you talked about a, a shared drive currently, do you know, uh, out of curiosity, what technology format you're planning to use to publish to make it available uh, for public consumption? Uh, Hope oh. Dalton, Director. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hinter. Um, do I know what format? That is a big question that I'm eager to have feedback on. So many of the formats require a budget uh, attached to it. And so the other um, states, if you're going to look at other state consortiums, they have an entire website full of many, many resources. And if we were to build out more than what we have right now is one web page. 
one web page that is is in the Department of Natural Resources overall website. And so if we were to build out a website that would take a little more planning and perhaps some budgetary um, considerations. The other thing is if we do a report, maybe we would need a technical writer or a graphic a person to do some infographics or something to that effect. Um, Harmony had an idea of videos. I love that idea of like, um, having both the written and a spoken options. However, that would also have a, um, a budgetary consideration. And we do have the DNR's YouTube channel and um, and they're all filed under the consortium. All of the all of the videos are filed under the consortium, but we don't have our own space online. So I can't answer that question yet, Emma, but I am I am appreciative of everything that people are sharing today. Thank you, Hope. Um, just one last follow up. Um, I. As we know that other folks have compiled libraries, I think it's really important to have studies about Colorado and Colorado's unique geography, um, not geography, geology. Um, well, I guess it's both. It's both mapping and then also the rocks themselves. And the. But is there a way to reference um, studies that are broader in nature um, for similar product, even though the specific geology um, and water needs of other regions might be different. So we could have like, this applies to Colorado and our various basins, but here's other materials from other regions. Is there a way to have both? Hope Dalton, director. Yes, Emma, that's what I've been working on initially with the New Mexico Consortium. They have several years on this. I think they've been in existence for about four years and they have looked at the geology and geography of the different basins in New Mexico, Texas, Pennsylvania, California. I think they're all participating and the different um, EPA regions have been participating in group calls. And so they also took that approach uh, of looking at similarities of basins even across the United States. Thank you, that's very helpful. Great, good discussion. Um, Irene? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, just in response to Hope's comment about sorting by um, by basin, um, I think it would be good to have keyword search on the documents too, so that if you want to be bring up all the documents that have to do with chemical analysis of water, that you'd be able to put in that keyword and flag those documents. Um, and there are several, or um, um, existing um, efforts in uh, produce water where it's actually um, in progress. Words like that where you can um, do some keyword searching on the documents. Thank you. Great, thank you. Other thoughts? All right, I'm gonna suggest we take a 10 minute break, return at 1020, and then uh, we'll get started a little early on presentations from EPA, ECMC, and CDPHE. So see everyone at 1020. Thanks. Hey, Hope. Uh, did, you see, uh, did you see I sent uh, the presentation? Just in the event that I have issues. I have I see the share screen button, but we, we use Teams, not Zoom, so. <laughs> so my suggestion is to have Jenny present for you because you saw me fumble and yeah that's what I was thinking too when I was like I may have trouble too so is did Jenny get it I didn't um Jenny are you online yes I got it you got are it you, okay perfect are you good with sharing for Trisha yeah thank you Jenny yeah thanks Jenny All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here again. Um, I think Hope, you maybe wanted to make a comment quick before we rolled into presentations. Thank you, Chair Master. Uh, 
I had an opportunity to just think about some of the feedback that uh, consortium members were providing on the case study and best practices deliverable. And I just wanted to emphasize, you don't have to be an expert in in field reuse and recycling. Um, what you bring to the table is much more important. We have representatives from a wide range of interests. So for example, if you have a best practice on how to organize outreach for disproportionately impacted communities, please share that with me. Or maybe it's about local land use regulations as it it relates to, to oil and gas or even specific to infield reuse and recycling. Each of you brings something special to the table and not all of us need to be oil and gas experts. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Hope. That's, uh, that's important for us to understand and that all of our voices need to be heard and all of the deliverables and topics that we're gonna be talking about and so uh thanks for that with that we'll kick it over to you trisha all right thank you uh trish pfeiffer from epa region eight and before i get started i wanted to thank you for allowing me to have the time to talk about uh, produce water um particularly related to the wrap and the regulatory landscape and I'd like to introduce, I hope Amy's on, Amy Maybach. I don't see Yep, you. I'm here. Oh, you are, okay. <laughs> uh, I invited Amy from Region 8 to join us. She's the programmatic produce water lead. Um, she's worked in both permitting and enforcement side of the house for MPDS discharges, which in the MPDS program is um, the, the permitting program that you can discharge, uh, produce water if it's uh, uh, good enough quality and a beneficial use. And so Amy, I didn't know if you want to say hello. Sure, yeah. Um, and I apologize. For some reason, it has me listed as Trisha Pfeiffer. So there's two Trisha Pfeiffers. <laughs> um, I am not Trisha Pfeiffer. Um, I don't know why. Maybe because I, I'm not a regular attendee. Um, so somehow it's recognizing me as Trish and not myself. But in any case, um, I'm Amy Maybach, and I'm with, as Trish mentioned, EPA uh, Region 8 here in Denver. And I'm the produce water lead for our water provision. So I handle a lot of the produce water discharges in Region 8, including obviously Colorado. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. And thank you so much for having me. Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. Hey, and um, Trish, I'm just going to mention, I, um, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. And I don't know if it's just on my end or not, but I want to make sure that everyone's muted who's not speaking. And maybe that will solve the feedback problem, unless I'm the only one hearing it. I don't, I'm not hearing it. Do you hear it when I talk? I actually don't hear it anymore. So maybe it was. Okay. Amazing. Okay. It, it could have been maybe because Amy and both, both of us were on at the same time. All right. So we'll uh, get into the presentation if we can go to the next slide. All right, um, so the agenda, so I'm gonna cover the water reuse action plan, which is commonly referred to as the RAP. I'll talk about the UIC program, which is under the Safe Drinking Water Act or SIDWA. The NIPTES program, which is under the Clean Water Act, and that stands for um, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System is what NPDES stands for, or NIPTES and then some other reuse and management activities. You can go to the next slide. So just to get us on the same page, um, produce water. It's a complex mixture. It's generated during the production of oil and gas, and it is innate geologic formation fluid and potentially chemical additives that been, ha have been used during production activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Production 
you know, chemical additives for production activities can include hydraulic fracturing, or it can include treatment chemicals or maintenance chemicals, um, and chemicals that are added to pipelines during distribution or holding ponds. Um, so like I said, it is a complex mixture. Uh, the chemicals that are used um, at a wellhead go down under temperature and pressure and can form daughter products or transformation byproducts. So what goes down the hole may not be what comes back up. Um, so just to get us all on the same page on produce water. Um, next slide. <clears throat> So the RAP, this is the National Water Reuse Action Plan that started under the previous administration in 2020. Um, the, I would say the driver is climate change and we're seeing a lot of communities in the West um, having difficulties meeting water needs. Um, <clears throat> local, state and federal governments are considering the expanded use of alternative water sources to augment fresh water as a direct result of climate change and increased water demand. The RAP identifies produced water as one of the five alternative water sources that's being explored for reuse. There are currently 66 action commitments, 14 of those align with potential produced water reuse and four actions are specific to produce water reuse. And in the, the circle here, you'll see it's made up kind of somewhat like this consortium, right? It's federal partners, water associations, academia, state, local governments, international partners, um, NGOs or ENGOs, I should say too, um, and water utilities and industrial partners. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So I thought it would be good to highlight just a couple of the key areas related to produced water. I have those bolded, um, but then the other additional action items um, that also could tie into produced water, I have those listed as well. But some to highlight is um, the EPA study of oil and gas. Uh, Amy and myself participated on that. We went across the United States and met with different stakeholders and, and learned what the different challenges were around produced water, whether it was lack of injection capacity or um, water needs, just different uh, challenges that are being faced on the East Coast versus the West Coast. And that's what that study encompassed. Um, there's also uh, 3.1 is compiling the existing fit for purpose specifications and EPA is leading that. And you'll notice in the parentheses, I have um, EPA or like 3.8 is EDF. That's who is the lead for that action item. And 3.8 is looking at regulatory programs for produce water reuse applications. And I believe that's still ongoing. Um, 4.2 is the New Mexico Consortium that actually was when they initially got stood up. And you'll see that uh, New Mexico Environmental Division is the, the lead for that. Um, and I also wanted to highlight down in um, 8.5 and 8.8 .8 gets into engagement with the medical community, but also with disadvantaged and rural communities on water reuse. So just to highlight some of the action items. Um, next slide. Of course, I get a tickle in my throat as soon as I have to present. <laughs> um, so the Safe Drinking Water Act. <clears throat> Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there are uh, the UIC program exists there. And that's the Underground Injection Control Program. Class two saltwater disposal wells or injection wells are, I would say, the most common means across the country for managing produced water. I have the definition of what a well is um, under there. I'm not gonna read it to you, but um, 
so disposal through class two saltwater disposal wells is the most common way to manage produce water. And there are very stringent regulations around um, the specifications for how the well is constructed, where you can inject, what or what um, formation you can inject into. And for the class two program, uh, Colorado has primacy of this program. That means that the state has codified regulations and they have the authority to implement this program. Um, <clears throat> class two is also used for enhanced oil recovery. Produce water is uh, uh, commonly used to do enhanced oil recovery. This is when you do water flood projects. Basically they um, inject into a producing formation with a bunch of wells around one well and increase the reservoir pressure so that that production well can produce more and that's enhanced oil recovery. And commonly produce water is reused. And um, in this, it's not disposal, right? It's not left behind. It's a, a bit of a circular loop because you put the water in and then it comes back out and it's reused. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, uh, components of the class two saltwater disposal injection wells is aquifer exemptions, which can um, be concerning, right? Because uh, so an aquifer uh, that is 10,000 parts per million TDS or less is considered an underground source of drinking water. It doesn't have to currently be being, being used it could be, be it could be used in the future, but so if it's less than 10,000 parts per million TDS, total dissolved solids, then you would have to have an aquifer exemption before you could dispose into that system. Um, probably another thing that folks have heard about around uh, injection wells is seismicity, so I thought I would just touch on it. Um, I put a uh, picture down here at the bottom, um, this is Oklahoma, and it wasn't from hydraulic fracturing, it actually was from disposal. And there were, I wanna say it was 37, they had a, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake, I think was the largest. And <clears throat> you know, they basically were lubricating the faults with the volume of produced water that was being injected at the, at the basement. And they ceased disposal in 37 wells and the seismicity um, ceased to happen. Um, so just thought I would throw that in. A um, Couple of other facts is uh, over, it's estimated over 2 billion gallons of fluids are injected a day through class two disposal wells across the United States. Most oil and gas wells that use injection um, that are that have injection wells are Texas, California, Oklahoma, and Kansas. And it's projected that there's 180,000 class two disposal wells in the United States. Next slide. <clears throat> Thanks. So under the Clean Water Act, you can dispose of produced water via discharge if you get um, a permit. And this is under the NPDES program, which is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And just want to point out that this rule was promulgated in the 70s, um, mostly for the West because of the you know, water constraints that we had even back then. And this is only allowed west of the 98 meridian. And you have to have this type of discharge if it's going to go into a navigable waters. And there is a difference, I won't go down the rabbit hole, but there's a difference between state waters and um, you know, waters of the US. There's uh, some differences in, in various states. Um, I should mention too, under this regulation, again, it was in the 1970s, organics were not considered or, or not regulated. And the language in this regulation is that the water has to be of good enough quality for use in wildlife propagation and agriculture. Currently in region eight, we have roughly 
uh, sorry, 450 surface water discharges of produced water. I believe in Colorado, there's roughly 20. Um, and I would say that the treatment that we have seen is pretty basic. Um, it basically just removes um, the oil and grease because there is an oil and grease limit. And the typical TDS or total dissolved solids for those waters that are being discharged is between 1,000 and 5,000 milligrams per liter, or you'll hear it called parts per million. Um, and just for some context, the National Secondary Drinking Water Regulation, which is not mandatory, so it's called the SMCL for TDS is 500 milligrams per liter, and TDS of salt water is greater than 35,000 milligrams per liter. Next slide. So produced water permitting, and this is specific to region eight, um, it's under subpart E. And like I said, it has the requirement that has to meet the requirements of being good enough quality and put to use. And it also has an oil and grease limit of 35 milligrams per liter. What we typically see um, permit limits for is sulfate chloride, TDS, or either specific conductivity or specific conducts, um, pH. Less often, we see limits for RADS toxicity, which is done through wet and sulfide. And I think, next slide. You know, actually, let's go back and I want to ask if anybody has any questions about the MPS program while I'm on it. So if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Yeah. I meant to stop after the wrap too, but I just kept going. <laughs> so I think Barbara Vasquez has a question. Okay, uh, this yep. Is, this is Barbara. This is a, a tangential question. So UIC class two wells are for produced water injection? Are they also used for CO2 injection? Um, CO2 is under class six. So I should have mentioned there's six classes of wells. Um, so class six is specifically for carbon capture and storage. Understood. Thank you very much for uh, clarifying that. Yes, you're welcome. And I don't know who came in order, so I'll just call it on the screen. Um, Harmony? I'm, oh gosh, not even totally sure where to begin. How many, how much did you say per day? Is injected? Uh, is injected? Um, when I looked it up, 2 billion gallons per day, and that's across the United States, so not in Colorado. But can you like break that down to, in the real world, that's the equivalent of how much the city of Denver uses in a day, a week, a month, a year, um, something like that. I could, I would need some time to do, uh, figure out what the, you know, do, and do then, some uh, math on the back end, but I, we definitely, you know, and maybe, what would be helpful, Harmony, is to look at what's injected in Colorado. And I, you know, disclosure, um, I was at an oil and gas conference Monday through Wednesday and did this presentation as fast as I could. So I couldn't I could deep dive into Colorado specifics, but I could do that. And it would help me because these are like arbitrary numbers that are really hard to conceptualize and visualize, unless this is something that you think about all the time. And I did dedicate a lot of time thinking about this. And I did a lot of research on this topic and talked to a lot of people and heard a lot of stories. And I can say that I am highly concerned um, about how things, and so I would like to see those numbers um, for Colorado. And also if you could ask um, nationally too, because I think that's important to know on the scale of things when we look at water, because water doesn't know boundaries and state borders. And I think it's important for perspective. And then I would also like to, and if this isn't already on the agenda somewhere, just plant the seed 
for us to hear about the impacts of salt on plants because I have a garden and that's something that I can relate to. And I know that, but just planting that seed and um, yeah, it's just a lot to digest and a lot to, I think you get what I'm saying. And now I'm just rambling like Commissioner Mesner does sometimes too. No, <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, that's good. I will look at the Colorado volumes. One thing also to consider is the volume of water that's being produced, it's also being produced from the production formation itself. So it's not all related to fresh water that's being used for hydraulic fracturing per se. I think next was Tracy. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Messner, Tracy Kozla, State Engineer's Office. I just wanted to clarify, I thought the MPDS permitting in Colorado was done by um, CDPHE, Water Quality Control Division. It is. Okay. It is. If I, didn't, if I didn't say that, I meant to say that as well. The UIC program and the MPDS program are both, um, um, the, both those programs are being run by the state. Yes. Stay tuned. Thanks. I think next was Clay Terry. Yeah, Clay Terry, uh, Tracy, did you did you indicate or uh, is the data that you're showing on this slide produced water permitting in Region Eight relative or to NPDS permitting? That was one question, and the second one I have is: Are there any air quality requirements that that coexist with these permitting water requirements? For region eight. Um, you know what? I'm gonna let Amy jump on, given she's she's the uh, program lead. If, if that's okay, I could answer. But I'm not Amy. Um, yeah. So this is Amy again. Apologize, but the my name is showing up as Patricia Piper. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, this these permits uh, requirements are what's found. The first bullet there that's found in the federal regulation. So all produce permits. It's produce water permits, excuse me, west of the 98th meridian, which is the only place it's allowed to have these discharges by regulation. Um, so yeah, these are the requirements in the federal regulation for that produce water discharge west of the 98th meridian. All produce water permits, those included in, those in Colorado and elsewhere. We have the vast majority of produce water permits west of the 98th meridian are in Wyoming. Um, and so this is kind of a generalization for what we see in produce water permits in our region. And again, Colorado is about 20, Montana has about 40, Wyoming has about 400. So orders of magnitude higher than both uh, Wyoming and, I'm sorry, than Colorado and Montana. And so this is just kind of a generality of what we see in the permits, the sulfate chloride. But again, all produce water permits have to have that oil and grease limit, have to have a beneficial use, for uh, agriculture or wildlife propagation, and then put be put to use during the period of discharge. That's in the federal regulation. And to your second question, there are no, and I'm not an air expert, so I don't even really wanna to speak to air very much, but this is a regulation authorized under the Clean Water Act. It is not related to the Clean Air Act. So there are a bunch of clean air requirements related to oil and gas, but not directly tied to this regulation specifically. This is authorized under the Clean Water Act and not in conjunction with the Clean Air Act. May I follow up with a question, uh, Amy? Yeah. Is, are there any uh, overlaps between uh, Clean Water Act and air quality uh, requirements that are considered in the permitting process? Um, I do a lot of Clean Water Act permitting. That's pretty much my, my main job. And no, in the Clean Water Act, there's no reference to you have to obtain for this industry, like oil and gas, you must obtain Clean Air Act permit XYZ. The Clean Air Act is a standalone statute, much like the Clean Air Act, and they don't reference each other. So there is no requirement for XYZ air permit in the Clean Water Act for certain, like in this case, oil and gas um, uh, requirements. So the, the two acts, unfortunately, don't um, uh, speak to each other. There's there's not a lot of referencing or actually any referencing 
um, between the two statutes. They were both developed at different times um, and promulgated. And so it's unfortunately, that's just not something uh, that these statutes and laws really do. Thank you. Good questions. Um, Tessa, you were next. Very quick. Um, I think it'd be helpful to know uh, probably afterwards in a doc or an email or something, um, what the ambient amounts of these chemicals are um, in there. What's, what's the uh, normal levels of sulfates, chlorides, TDS, things like that in a lot of the waters being discharged to because we see permit limits um, but I'm curious as to what the normal content of said water is. A really good example is water in the Gulf does has in the Gulf of Mexico does have naturally occurring oil. But no right. those are so where we're going beyond, we good to know. Amy, can you speak to that with respect to water quality standards? Yeah, so that would be captured in water quality standards assessments, which are done periodically by either the states or EPA, depending on who has um, authority and who's implementing clean water or uh, water quality standards. Um, so that's captured in the water quality assessments. Clean Water Act, uh, specifically point source discharges, which is what we're talking about here with oil and gas, only regulate the actual outfall, the discharge point. So for my program, it wouldn't really capture the ambient or background concentrations for chlorides and sulfides. That would be done, again, through water quality assessments, which are done periodically, um, not on a routine basis like monitoring for a discharge uh, would be. So I hope that kind of helps answer your question. It is done, just not through the permitting program. The permitting is solely at the outfall and only regulates at the outfall location. Um, Ember, I think you're next. Thank you, Ember Michael. I have a question with um, with the state having primacy from the um, from the EPA. Or does the state adopt the subpart E and do like incorporation references, or are there their own standards? Or um, if we were to go, is, does the CDPHE manage the class two? permits or is that ECMC and is for looking at the all the requirements would you first start with the state and then just assume that EPA has that um, incorporated by reference thank you so Amy I'll let you jump in too if you want to say anything but so when rules or regulations are codified they have to meet the same standard as EPA, like that's the, the, the bar that you have to meet. They can have differences, but they have to be, um, I'm losing my word. <laughs> they have to be um, as stringent. Yeah. As stringent. Yeah. <laughs> as stringent. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, does that answer the question for both of those or did you want something more specific? It does. Um, and I was just looking specifically at the class two SWD from the, the permit. So is that through CDPHE or ECMC? Uh, class two is through ECMC. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And, and then MP, the NPDES I'm going to say is through uh, CDPHE, right, Amy? Yes. Yep. So that answers that. I always, I always check myself if Amy's on the call. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks, Amber. Um, I think Jolie was next. Jolie, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jolie Bronner. And this is, if we don't have an answer for this, just say that's two in the weeds, Jolie. Um, with the overturning of the Sackler decision in May, do we see any changes to the authority of the EPA for permitting, or is this post? decision and this is still kind of that authority or is it unaffected when we talk about wetlands and not moving water and that's a separate thing altogether um and if we can't unpack that that's okay yeah wetlands um tricky uh amy i don't know if you want to give a uh yeah i can kind of yeah i think i can i think i heard everything so with the did you say kind of overturn of waters or the 
U.S.? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, there's the overturn okay. of the waters of the U.S. I know that some of the permitting um, is still in flux, and so I didn't know if this was post waters of the U.S. or if this was during or if we see changes to this with that decision. Well, like Trish mentioned, this regulation goes back to the 70s, and it references navigable waters, which are generally considered waters of the U.S. or jurisdictional waters. So every time the definition changes, as it does every... <laughs> few years, we, we go to court, we settle, we have appeals, so forth. Um, the, the definition of navigable waters or jurisdictional waters changes, but um, the regulation itself has been on the books and promulgated since the 70s. So this change of the waters of the U.S. as it comes and goes will not change this regulation. What will change is what is a navigable water and therefore subject to this regulation. Does that make that sense? Made, Does that that make actually sense? made perfect. That was helpful context. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, no problem. I think, Doug, you were next. Yes, I just wanted to, this is more of a kind of a statement or let everyone know on this topic. Um, our company, NGL Water Solutions, um, we had, it's passed, we since divested of it this year, in southwestern Wyoming near Pinedale. Um, we had a plant there that operated for almost 15 years under NPDES discharge permit. Um, we treated produced water from the natural gas production there in the area and discharged to the New Fork River under our permit. Um, the water there in that area is not completely different from the water in the DJ Basin in Colorado. Um, we discharged tens of millions of barrels of water into the Green Upper Green River Basin through the New Fork River um, over that period. It was a very successful, um, both technically and, and economically, is a very successful project. Um, just want to point out that it it has been done. We are one of the ones that has, done, has achieved it. Um, we divested out of the project just due to economics at this point. Um, but, you know, that water has gone through the Colorado River system, you know, some of it into Colorado over the last 15 years. Um, I'm going to point that out to everyone. Um, we'll also say that the state of Texas has primacy uh, as well on their uh, discharge permitting. Um, we have submitted an application for uh, the same type of discharge, although the water in the Delaware Basin is extremely different than the water in the, in the DJ or the uh, the Pinedale area. Um, but I will point out that, um, you know, we're not looking for consumptive type, um, I guess, outfalls, more more of a stream of outfall that commingles with existing waters. But I will state that when we did our wet testing to achieve our permit, uh, our water was too clean um, and we didn't pass the wet test. So we actually had to remineral remineralize the water um, in order to achieve um, the survive, surviving from the toxicology perspective um, of the, the minnows that were, were there in that testing. So I just want to point that out to everyone that uh, our company has done it. We're working on it in Texas. It's an opportunity in Colorado. Um, now there's a long road to go, of course, um, from certainly the not just the technical and economic side of it, but also the, the public license to operate under that, that condition as well. Thank you. Amy, it may be helpful. Can we describe what wet testing is real quick, just for an educational piece? Sure. So wet testing um, is an acronym for whole effluent toxicity. And what it is is a test that is taken at the outfall, so the water that's going into the river or the creek um, being discharged, so not of the actual river or creek itself. Well, you know, downstream after it mixes with the discharge, but actually at the outfall as the water is flowing into the river, um, it's captured. And that water is taken to a laboratory where it undergoes either acute or chronic whole effluent toxicity testing. And the species that you use will vary. Um, so typically what we see is acute toxicity testing with flathead minnows, um, things like that. So very simple aquatic life and you expose the organisms to the 
effluent at various concentrations over an extended period of time. And that time varies depending if you're doing an acute test versus, versus a chronic test. But it's really to determine the toxicity of your effluent. Um, and some oil and gas permits have whole effluent toxicity testing uh, requirements. Some actually have limits in them, but those are more of the exception than the rule, I would say, at this point. For, and again, speaking in generalities here, this is all produce water permitting west of the 90th meridian, not just Colorado. Um, but it's, again, it's a, it's a way to see uh, holistically what is the toxicity effect of your effluent on the receiving water. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's the best tool we have at this time to kind of judge you know, uh, or determine the uh, effect that your discharge would have on aquatic life in the stream. So you're kind of mimicking that environment in a laboratory setting. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know so who's next. I've got a couple more. So we've got Peter, we've got Michael, we've got Irene. I do want to just acknowledge that we do have three speakers today, and I don't want to limit questions or conversations, but I do want to make sure we get through all the speakers today. And so, uh, but go ahead, Peter. Thanks. Yeah, I was just curious if EPA has ever um, permitted the reuse of produced water in Colorado <clears throat> for agriculture or drinking water purposes, or does that kind of just happen sort of indirectly um, after produced water has been discharged, say, to a, a river, and then at some point downstream, that water might be diverted for irrigation or, or some other use like that? Thanks. Yeah, and so just to, um, the state has primacy of the program, so I think that would be a good question for the, the next speakers. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's not happening, but we might hear different when the, when the state talks. Uh, Michael? Thank you. Um, and thank you both for this presentation. This is really helpful background. Um, I'm thinking about our upcoming deliverables, and I was wondering if um, you had any thoughts on possible ways that the UIC or the NIPTES permits might be better coordinated or better coordinated with ECMC permitting. Um, and I'm not thinking specifically of say like regulatory changes to encourage reuse, but you know things that might be done in the realm of coordination and efficiency within the existing rules that, that govern, uh, that Colorado has for each of these programs. Yeah. Um, so again, the state has primacy for both those programs. Um, maybe we can talk offline and brainstorm or well, have to think good, about. Maybe about maybe it. put a pin in it. And I mean, put a pin in it. <laughs> good, good, good question, Mike, but um, maybe put a pin in it. Let's hear kind of the baseline information here, and then maybe we can, you know, incorporate that into a, a conversation, you know, as we start to look at ways to better coordinate between federal and state agencies. Sure. Yep, thanks. Um, I think, Irene, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, I was, thank you for this presentation. Um, are norms, uh, are there limits on norms, the naturally occurring radi radioactive materials? Amy? Yeah, and PDS permits. I'm sorry, sure. Uh, in the permits that we're talking about here, yes. permits of produced water discharges, okay, for yeah. ag and wildlife application. Okay. Yeah. Um, it depends. It depends on the formation that they're uh, producing out of, whether or not there will be permit limits for, for RADS. Um, Thank you. Wyoming generally does. Um, Colorado, I think, does as well. Um, it will vary by state and again by formation if it if they're present or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll wrap right. up. Yeah, I think well, like you want to keep going. Minutes. That'll be yeah. great. Okay, uh, next slide. And this is just it should be other practices. So evaporation ponds is another way produce water spanish. We see this in Utah and, you know, challenges around this is air emissions, obviously VOCs and SVOCs. 
Um, in Utah, they've seen increased ozone la- levels, especially during winter time. Um, and then you have contaminants that are being dispersed across the watershed. And then you see the uh, black liner there. You can obviously have breaches in that, and then you can have groundwater impacts. Um, next slide. Uh, infiltration basins, we see this a lot in California. So these are just other practices for managing produced water. Um, this is from the Central Valley and uh, they've seen impacts to regional aquifers, um, salts, carcinogens, and other toxins have been introduced through this practice because the water basically is untreated and then um, goes through these various uh, channels and infiltrates into the shallow aquifer system. Next slide. Uh, Land application, um, we're seeing, uh, we've seen permits uh, pop up in Wyoming for this activity to grow uh, range grasslands. And I have to say the the permit is pretty robust. Uh, Amy and I worked with the state of Wyoming on that. The other thing that's happening, and this is uh, mostly we're seeing this in California, is agriculture. They're using produced water to grow human consumption crops. This has been being done for over 20 years. Um, I should mention the TDS of their water is around 500 parts per million TDS. It's in that drinking water limit. So it's uh, not high salt content, it's drinking water level. And, um, you know, the bigger concern with uh, what California is dealing with is the large volume of maintenance chemicals that they use. And, um, you know, uh, that work is still continuing. If you're interested in it, let me know. You can also look it up. Uh, I put some hyperlinks in there. And um, they have a white paper that discusses all the data gaps that they need to investigate, and I'm not exactly sure where the water board is at on filling those data gaps yet. Next slide. So recently, I was just, um, I just heard a state panel talk uh, on Wednesday, and uh, one of the big challenges that Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Julie was there from ECMC um, and Texas brought up is produce water, produce water challenges, management, Um, different types of challenges. And I just listed out some here, you know, industry practices obviously have changed since the 1970s when uh, the rule, the NPDES rule was um, promulgated under the Clean Water Act. Um, There's a lack of disclosure requirements right now. Only 27 states um, are using frac focus. Many of the chemicals and the products that are being used for maintenance and hydraulic fracturing still are listed as proprietary. Uh, Maintenance chemicals are not required to be disclosed. And I would say maintenance chemicals are used far more at a wellhead than uh, hydraulic fracturing is happening. And um, there's been a study done and uh, there's a huge overlap between what's used in hydraulic fracturing and maintenance chemicals. They're somewhat the same biocides, corrosion inhibitors, scale reducers. Um, all those different types of chemicals that are being used. And again, what I said, what's applied at the surface may not be what comes back up. These chemicals go under temperature and pressure. They can change composition. You get transformation products, daughter products. Um, Huge challenge around analytical methods. There's a lot of chemical additives that are being used, but there's not analytical methods for those chemicals. So it makes it it determining fit for purpose difficult. And toxicity, we talked about wet testing. Wet test looks at acute and chronic um, kind of, does it live, does it not live? It doesn't identify if you have carcinogens, mutagens, or endocrine disruptors uh, in that mixture. Um, treatment technologies have expanded and improved, but um, you know, determining the efficacy is challenging because we have a lack of analytical methods. And I'll leave it at that. Um, Thank you again for letting me present. And uh, that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Trisha and Amy for presenting. Um, Super good information. I'm sure that people still have questions. 
Um, we do have about five minutes that we can uh, perhaps answer just a couple more questions uh, before we'll go on to Tessa at CDPHE. So I know that uh, Peter, Ember, and Harmony all still have hands up. I didn't know if you had questions or uh, whether those were from your previous questions. No questions. Sorry about that. I'll lower it. Okay. Uh, how about Jacob? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I, I just had no question. Just that was fantastically helpful. I really appreciate the presentation and the deck. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you again. Super appreciate the information. Um, and I think as we were going through, Hope was putting links from your presentation into the chat. I'm sure we'll provide those in another format. Um, after the meeting as well. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, with that, I will kick it over to Tessa from CDPHE uh, to share what's happening over there. Okay, can everybody see the produced water roadmap on my on the screen? No, I see a blue Microsoft screen. Ah, uh, let me change that then. Sorry, that's my bad. Let's see here. You'd think we'd all be significantly better at this by now. Uh, I'm horrible <laughs> at it, so. There we go. You should see it now. Yes. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to actually talk on a PowerPoint today. What I'm going to do is go through a wonderful doc that was actually put together in large part by the Hazardous Waste and uh, um, Hazardous Materials and Waste Management Division. Um, uh, here at CDPHE. So first, before I dive into this, I want to talk about the differences in the divisions within CDPHE and the different agencies. Um, we have the Energy and Carbon Management Commission, which, uh, yes, Barbara. It's, um, Is there any way you can zoom in on this a little bit so it's easier for yes. people to see on the small screen? Thank you. I can absolutely do that for sure. Um, how's that? You also you also have this available as a link in your email yeah. too, if that's helpful. Um, this is publicly available for sure. Okay, so um, first I want to talk about the differences in the divisions because I know that can be kind of confusing for those of uh, who are not actually in state agencies or work with us frequently. Um, there is the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Public Health and Environment are the two big agencies here involved with that. Within DNR, there is uh, where Tracy Kosloff sits, which is the State Engineer's Office um, under the Department of Water Resources, um, as well as the Energy and Carbon Management Commission, which regulates um, oil and gas, among other things now as well. Um, in the Department of Public Health and Environment, we kind of have two halves. Um, one half is public health, medical, um, uh, mental health, things like that. Um, and then there is the um, environment side, and that's predominantly what we're talking about here. And that involves uh, three big divisions. One is air quality um, or the air pollution control division, which has their own commission, the air quality control commission. Um, there is water quality, which is the um, water quality control division has its own commission, which is the water quality control commission. And then there is the hazardous um, materials and waste management division. Um, so there's three kind of players there. We're not going to talk really about air today, but we will talk a fair amount about WQCD and about um, what I'll just call has or has waste um, because it's one of the easiest ways to refer to it. Otherwise, it's a bit of a mouthful. So with that, let's dive into kind of who does what. This is a, a very high level jurisdictional kind of map. Um, note that everything I talk about, there are exceptions to pretty much everything in terms of who has to be involved in various cases. But first, uh, following EPA, let's talk about injection. If you're taking produced water and you're putting it back into the ground, um, and in this case, this is a federal definition of injection, so that is both for injection, it's in for any reason, whether it's injection to produce more oil, such as a water flood or secondary recovery in oil and gas fields, or whether it's simply a disposal well, it is an injection well. And so it's permitted as such. Um, class one permits are managed by the EPA. Class two permits are as well. However, in class two permit in this case, 
is um, exploration and production. So this is oil and gas produced water. Um, it has been delegated down to the state level um, in Colorado uh, uh, with the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. So they actually manage those wells in terms of those permits. Um, obviously, you'll see this on uh, pretty much every category. Doing so without a permit is illegal. Um, so you, you have to have a permit um, to put that in. What you'll see in class one permits is everything not oil and gas, um, but is also water related. So it could be many, many, many things um, and is outside of our scope. So if you're not putting it down a well um, and you are planning to discharge it into surface waters, um, that is going to be the Department of um, Water Quality, the Water Quality Division here, um, WQCD, which our, our member, Brandy Honeycutt, is a member of. Um, so that is for into waters of the state. Um, this is not groundwater, that's injection. So we're talking rivers, um, wetlands, uh, th streams, things like that. Um, that is a discharge permit. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between that and some of the other things here in a second as I go through the nuances. Um, obviously, just taking produced water and pouring it into a river is illegal without a permit. So evaporation is actually a really, really common um, tactic. I think this spans a couple pages um, or a couple areas here. Uh, there is a commercial impoundment, and that is basically a facility where you produce water to it. Um, like it, you take the produced water and you then uh, put it in a controlled uh, facility where it is evaporated off to dispose of that water. Um, and the solids and the waste off of that is handled um, uh, separately and is part of that entire operation. That entire operation is actually permitted through the HAZ division here in um, the Hazardous Waste Division in, in CDPHE. So it's, if, it, if it's an evaporation facility, it is that. If it is non-commercial, so notice it says permitted commercial versus non-commercial. Commercial means it's being sold or you're paying someone to take it. A non-commercial on-site pit means the operator who produced the water doesn't give it to anyone else, um, either by paying them or they pay for it to do something with it. It is theirs still. And if they're going to um, evaporate it off in a pit, that permit is, be, is with the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. If you have a centralized waste management facility, this is basically a crossover between the two of those things. Um, it's a non-commercial, or it is commercial because there's multiple operators involved, but they have a unitized agreement, like a joint operating agreement, and they are taking care of that water together in partnership. That, because it remains within that industry, within that space, still stays with the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. Just putting um, produced water in a pit and evaporating it without a permit is, or in an impoundment is illegal. Um, the same thing for just spraying it on the ground. Um, can't do that either. Uh, and I think, let me, yes, okay. Um, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna loop back here after I talk about these other things. For disposal, such as like a landfill disposal at a solidification basin, because that's under, um, that is almost the same as a, as a commercial impoundment. You are paying someone to take this water and dispose of it at their landfill facility that is under hazardous waste. If you don't get a permit for that, obviously that is illegal. Um, and because you haven't arranged to sell that to someone, I believe that permit violation would actually be under ECMC. Uh, reuse and recycling, what we're here for the most. Uh, if you are selling it to someone or they buy it off of you and you're an operator, then that permit is actually through the hazardous waste um, division. So that uh, and what you're going to reuse it and, and recycle it for is permitted by hazardous waste. If you are not selling it to someone or they are not buying it from you and it is still yours and you plan to reuse it, then it stays in the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. You may be seeing a pattern here. Um, that pattern is that if an operator keeps possession of that produced water, then the permitting for that stays within the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. If they are selling it or it is being bought off of them, 
then it goes over into hazardous waste um, unless it is being discharged to surface waters, at which point it goes to water quality. That's kind of the high level summary here. Um, if you have an approved land application of produced water, this is where it gets a little weird, um, where it's basically greater than the rate of evaporation. A really good example of this is dust suppression, spraying it on roads. That is either water quality or hazardous waste. The reason is either or is it depends upon the volume. Typically, these are actually hazardous waste permits because they are not in a volume that actually discharges to the surface waters. If they're spraying too much or they're spraying too much for it to evaporate off from the road and would get into surface waters, then it goes to water quality because it's basically considered a surface discharge. Um, if it's commercial, you're selling it to someone to do that with, then it's hazardous waste. Um, and if you are, again, keeping it and not selling it or having it bought off of you, and you, like if you, the operator, are producing this produced water and you keep possession of it and are utilizing it for dust suppression after treating or what, whatever else, um, then you it stays with the CMC again. Um, just spreading that water around without a permit is illegal. So that's the high level summary. I wanted to go over this quickly and I can touch on these again. I can't guarantee I have the answers for specific applications on all of this, but really once again, just for the general understanding, because this can be really confusing. And if water rights become involved, the state engineer's office um, uh, with our, our governing body member, Tracy Kosloff is, is there, um, they, they handle a lot of that because the water rights becomes its own issue. And water rights, especially in Colorado, are exceptionally complicated um, in many cases. So if an operator is producing it and they're keeping it, it stays with the, with the who permitted the wells, basically. And if they are not keeping it, it goes over to our agency, CDPHE. I hope that's a helpful kind of high level. I'm certainly open for questions now. Thanks. Thanks for that, Tessa. And I, I'll note too that everyone has this in their um, in their inbox, and it's hyperlinked as well. So you know, as you open that and you hyperlink it, you'd be able to access the different regulations that it's talking about in that roadmap. So I, I thought that was a really helpful piece too to have it hyperlinked. But a lot of um, I think Commissioner Pinter, I saw you first. Yes, thank you, uh, Emma Pinter, Adams County. Um, you touched on something that I would um, like some more information on, um, particularly uh, reproduce, I'm looking at my notes, uh, reproduce water for fugitive dust mitigation and surface application. And that's something that's really curious to me um, because you talked about water quality potentially, but then also potentially hazardous waste. And one of the things that is um, nagging at me is yes, there are processes for each of those, but then also, even if it is um, applicated or sprayed in a way so that the water evaporates, um, what are the stormwater implications for what remains and how is that tracked? Right, so that is a has question on that. So that would okay. go through the space, they would look at that. Um, the short version is there's a couple of examples I can give here. Um, and, and this comes from my, my extensive consultation with the has division specifically on this topic. Uh, is that those permits, when they're issued, um, are with the understanding that the water will be, can, will be tested um, quite a lot. There will be um, uh, uh, a lot of soil samples to make sure that nothing is being deposited in greater amounts than expected um, or permitted. Uh, if they are, of course, they have to stop. If, it, if they're spraying too much fluid, um, and, and that can, that's where it really becomes a question of whether it's water or has is, you're permitted for dust suppression, but your trucks are spraying too much. Your misters are, are actually not, not set correctly. And so you're spraying too much. Then it goes to the surface waters. Then it becomes a concern both with has because it was their original permit and with water quality because you have started to discharge in the surface waters. So that, that's where it becomes a, a kind of cross divisional effort on that front. Um, I would say the dust suppression, suppression using produced water um, is fairly rare in this state. Um, it does happen, um, on, but it's, it's usually through a commercial um, process. So it's been sold and recycled or re, re, and treated 
um, to get the permit to utilize for that. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. And Commissioner, most new permits that are being issued by ECMC actually include provisions to, to not allow produced water to be utilized in dust suppression. Okay, and thank before you. Before we go on to another question, I want to actually answer a question from the prior topic, which was about norm and T-norm. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with what the difference is between those. NORM stands for naturally occurring radioactive material. T-NORM is technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive material, which basically means through some technological process or through production, the radioactivity has level has been increased beyond background levels. There's no set quantifier that says what that should, what, what makes it T-NORM. It has to do with what the ambient is. So if you have norm levels and they're about the same as what's there already, it's considered norm. If you take that exact same substance and go to a different part of the country or the state where the norm levels are lower, then it becomes T-norm. And hazardous waste does monitor that. That's also part of hazardous waste permits. Next I saw Doug. Uh, Doug White, NGL. Um, question on the commercial versus non-commercial. So if a recycler takes possession of the water but not title to the water performs a recycling service as a service fee or service charge um, and then the water is then treated and and returned to the producer does that have a, is that a driver is it is it taking title to the water that's the driver delineation between being commercial or non-commercial no, um, the, it, is, it is a matter of whether it was sold. So that's, that recycling service would have to have a HAZ permit to treat it. So a producer can treat water, but a third party commercial company such as a midstream company would not be able to unless they went through uh, CDPHE. A producer cannot treat water and then reuse it for discharge other than underground or, 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 or reuse and reuse it unless they get that as part of permitting through ECMC. It's just a matter of who handles that authorization. Yeah. So that ECMC permit. would be produced directly producer related, but uh, a midstream water company such as ourselves, we would have to go to CDPHE for authorization to treat? Correct. So the, the treatment facility can be permitted. So, okay, we can take this offline. We, we yeah. have had previously treated water in the DJ basin near Briggsdale in 2013-14. Um, maybe the things have changed. I believe we did that through CDPHE authorization, um, but maybe, have, are you aware if those have changed over the years? Uh, I'm not aware of that, but I will get you the contact of the person within Hazardous Waste to ask that question right. too, to be able to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm making a note of it right now. Thank and you. hope you could too, that'd be great. Barbara? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, I want to go back, if I might, to the dust suppression topic. And I appreciate your comment, John, that most new permits uh, are not allowing for use of produced water for dust suppression on site or on roads. But I just want to compare dust suppression on dirt roads in Colorado or gravel roads in Colorado is awful, often done with calcium chloride. And calcium chloride, this salt level gets high enough that it kills adjacent um, vegetation. There's a whole study that CSU has done and trying to drive um, use of lignin sulfate or other um, dust suppression solids or liquids other than uh, calcium chloride, which brings us to produce water. and even if uh, the misters are set correctly and that the water that's being applied evaporates in a reasonable period of time, you're still leaving not only salts, but all those unknowns that were spoken to uh, by EPA in the earlier presentation. We don't have the analytical tools to know what it is that we would be depositing so for that reason, I just wanted to amplify on that, that topic. I'm really glad to hear that ECMC is not allowing that because there's so many unknowns in what would be 
leached out of that road or that pad into surrounding landscape or surface water. There's a really good example with hazardous waste where we actually had, um, I don't believe it was an oil and gas operator, but it was a different industry operator. And they wanted to use dust pressure because this applies to everyone, not just E&P e waste stuff. Um, and, and where they had a high, it might actually be an EMP, but they have, they had high amounts of magnesium in their, in their water um, that they wanted to use. And, and mag magnesium chloride is the other common alternative for dust suppression. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the oil and gas world, we typically just call it mag. Um, and so they wanted to use it um, as, as kind of a inbuilt mag system. And that permit ended up having to um, go ask for additional sampling. Um, and uh, that got referred over in cooperation with the EPA. The EPA um, said, okay, you're also gonna have to test for these other like 40 things. And the operator said, never mind." And walked away from the project. But even with the testing that you have in your uh, suite, uh, looking at toxicity as opposed to uh, mutagenicity or carcinogenicity, et cetera, or endocrine disruptors, it doesn't really cover the landscape that we would be interested in as, as humans or humans interested in wildlife habitat. Right, and CDPAG has a very, very, very busy um, little division, um, which is specifically on toxicology. And that's the bridge between our environmental side and our public health side. Um, they work for both and partner with both to do toxicology studies and advice. Thanks for the time. Mm -hmm. Jeff, then Ember, and then we probably should move on to the next presenter. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And and just just sort of to build on uh, the comments that uh, that you made and, and that Barbara made regarding uh, application for dust suppression. Um, just just one thing to recognize um, is that you know oftentimes uh, you know especially for, for peons operators, we operate on federal land, and there is a component here that's important to note with respect to how BLM um, uh, regulates uh, dust suppression uh, techniques. Um, Frankly, uh, produced water is, is not allowed by BLM. Um, there's a lot of concern about uh, items that, that revolve uh, around uh, water quality, wildlife. Um, and so uh, often we are utilizing fresh water as a requirement for dust suppression in our operations. And I think that's important to note as we think holistically about reducing fresh water in oil and gas operations. This is a really good example of where fresh water is uh, makes sense and is required to some extent uh, in in federal law, uh, you know, with respect to our our operations um, on BLM surface, and and we're very sensitive to that as an operator, of course. But I just wanted to uh, provide that additional information uh, to fellow members. I think that's a good ad about the difference between federal lands versus non. That's really good ad. Ember. Hey, Ember Michael. I just wanted to say thank you. This was a really great um, presentation, Tessa. And earlier in my comments when I was asking for kind of a roadmap, this is exactly it to show the um, regulatory authority and then to highlight the federal and state um, um, primacy. So thank you. That was just my whole thing. It's really helpful for the consortium to have this uh, roadblock or roadblock roadmap and building block. So thank you. It was years in the making by the House Division. They did a fantastic job. I think we might have time for Commissioner Pinter's question. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Pinter, if you still have a question. I, I owe all of you at least two donuts. This is the second time I forgot to put my hand down. My apologies. <laughs> I do like donuts. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. Any other questions? All right. Great. Thanks, Tessa, for uh, presenting and sharing that information. Super helpful. Um, and with that, we're going to kick it over to John Heil uh, to share a little bit about ECMC's regulatory processes. I see your presentation, John. But I think okay. Yeah. There we go. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I got my presentation up, got my notes going. 
Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. My name is John Heil, and I am the Northwest Environmental Protection Specialist at the Energy and Carbon Management Commission, also known as the ECMC. Today, we will be discussing the ECMC's rules and regulations as they relate to produced water. A little about myself, I have been with the ECMC for approximately five and a half years now and operate in Northwest Colorado, also known as the Peons Basin. As you can see from the snap, I operate in Garfield County, Rio Blanco County, and Pitkin County. Living in Grand Junction allows for easy access to the areas I operate in. My background is geology with a focus on hydrology and geophysics. My work at the ECMCs deals with very as various aspects of produced water, which we'll be examining in today's presentation. ECMC's rules and regulations. Here is a list of the current ECMC's rules and regulations. The rules and regulations are broken down into series. The highlighted series contains some type of rules and regulations related to produced water. As you can see, produced water is covered in the majority of the series. The bold series are the ones we will be mostly focusing on in today's presentation. ECMC's forms. ECMC's forms are used for documenting compliance with the rules and regulations in the previous slide. ECMC currently has forms labeled one through 45 with associated names. Today's presentations will focus on the forms displayed on the screen. The Form 7 is currently under construction to capture the well reporting and oil and gas location reporting requirements outlined in House Bill 23-1242. So what is produced water? Produced water is considered exploration and production waste. The definition of EMP waste can be seen at the bottom of the screen. A general rule of thumb is that EMP waste is any fluids or materials that go down a well bore and come back to the surface, or any fluids or materials that come from down a well bore. EMP waste is generated over the life of a well. Some examples are drilling fluids, flowback fluids, drill cuttings, and of course, produced water. Produced water is not specifically defined within the ECMC's 100 series definitions. ECMC's rules and regulations surrounding produced water were established on the notion that produced water is considered EMP waste. A definition of produced water that I put together is produced water is the brackish and saline water that is a byproduct of the extraction of energy resources, including oil and gas and geothermal development and production. Here is an outline for the presentation today, which will cover how ECMC regulates produced water in Colorado. We will be looking at storage, transportation, management, and disposal of produced water, as well as the spills and releases and remediations with regards to produced water. Produced water storage. Storage of produced water is covered under the 600 series and 900 series rules. The 600 series outlines the requirements for storing produced water within tanks and the secondary containment structures that the tanks are required to be placed in. The 900 series covers centralized EMP waste management facilities, which are non-commercial treatment storage and disposal facilities that are permitted and regulated by the ECMCs. These are generally permitted and utilized by a single operator. Commercial treatment storage and disposal facilities are permitted and regulated through the CDPHE. Commercial facilities are for profit and can be used by multiple operators. The 900 series also outlines the requirements for permitting, construction, operation, and lining requirements for pits that are used for the storage of produced water. Permitting of a pit is done by the review and the approval of a Form 15 pit permit. If a pit is to be utilized for greater than three years, 
it needs to be permitted as a centralized EMP waste management facility via an approved Form 28. Rules and regulations regarding pit emissions can be found under Rule 903. Here is a photo from Rio Blanco County, Colorado. These are produced water tanks within a secondary containment structure, which is known as a tank factory. EMC staff, including myself, conduct regular inspections of these tank batteries. Here is a photo of a centralized EMP waste management facility located in Garfield County, Colorado. Centralized EMP waste management facilities are permitted through a Form 28 and must comply with all requirements outlined in Rule 907. ECMC staff, including myself, also conduct regular inspections of these centralized EMP waste management facilities. This is actually the, my truck in the background here. Produced water transportation. Transportation of produced water is captured in the 1100 series rules, flow line regulations. First, we have the definition of a flow line. The definition of a flow line is long, so we will be focusing on the last section where it states a segment of pipe transferring produced water between a wellhead and the point of disposal, discharge, or loading. Also, let's take a look at the definition of a produced water transfer system, which is a system of off-location flow lines that transport produced water generated at one or more well site. Registration is required for flow lines and produced water transfer systems. This registration is done by submitting a Form 44 to the ECMC for approval. For produced water transfer system, financial assurance is required per Rule 703E. The 1100 series rules also cover integrity management of flow lines. This includes annual pressure testing, smart pigging, and continuous pressure monitoring. Here is an aerial view of registered produced water transfer systems. The red dots are oil and gas wells, and the orange lines are the registered produced water transfer systems of various operators. The town of Parachute can be seen in the bottom right hand corner down here, and I-70 can be seen cutting through Parachute, which is the screen line here. Produced water management. Produced water management is covered under the 900 series rules, specifically rule 905, management of EMP waste. Let's recall from slide five that produced water is classified as EMP waste and is therefore managed as EMP waste. Waste management plans. Waste management operators are required to submit a waste management plan as part as their form 2A oil and gas location assessment per rule 304 C11. Waste management plans include information on how the operator will treat, characterize, manage, store, dispose, and transport all types of waste generated, including produced water. A Form 4 sundry can be used if an operator chooses to change or update their waste management plan. This Form 4 can either be approved or denied by the ECMC. Treatment of produced water. Operators will treat produced water prior to placing it in production pits to prevent crude oil, condensate, or hydrocarbon sheen from entering the pit. Produced water disposal. We will be discussing produced water disposal in the coming slides. Produced water reuse and recycling. Operators may reuse produced water for enhanced recovery, drilling, completion, and other approved uses that are consistent with existing water rights and in consideration of water quality standards established by the Water Quality Control Commission. 
We then have water share agreements. These are agreements between two or more operators for the transfer of produced water between operators and are submitted via a waste management plan on a farm for a sundry. This usually involves transferring of produced water between centralized EMP waste management facilities via the produced water transfer system. Water share agreements must be approved or denied by the ECMC staff within 60 days of submittal by the operator. Produced water disposal. Produced water can be disposed of in various ways. First, produced water may be disposed of in by injecting injection into a class two UIC well permitted by the 800 series rules. Operators submit a form 26 source of produced water for disposal and sample the produced water before injecting into the well. It can also be disposed of in a class one injection well that is permitted by the EPA. ECMC also allows the disposal of produced water in evaporation and percolation pits if they are permitted properly through the 900 series rules. Produced water can also be disposed of at a permitted commercial facility and discharged into the waters, into waters of the state if there is an approved CDPHE discharge permit. Here is a photo of an ejection well located in Garfield County. The black material around the well is heat tape and insulation to prevent the produced water to freeze from freezing in the winter. Water is pumped into the ejection well via the flow line that originates on the left side of the photo. Injection wells have telematics, which allows the operator to monitor the pressure of the well remotely. ECMC staff, including myself, conduct regular inspection of these permitted injection wells. Spills, releases, and remediation. For spills and releases of produced water, we will be examining the 900 series, specifically Rule 912 and Rule 913. Rule 912 contains specific spill release reporting criteria. If the spill release of EMP waste meets one or more of these criteria, then it must be reported to the ECMC. A 24 hour notice is required and a Form 19 initial spill slash release report must be submitted to the ECMC within 72 hours of the discovery of the spill and release. All EMP waste must be immediately removed and confirmation samples are required in order to demonstrate the cleanup and removal of EMP waste. EMC, ECMC cleanup standards for waters and soils are listed in Table 915-1. Table 915-1 covers organic compounds, inorganic compounds, and metals. Spills and releases of produced water can occur at flow lines, pits, tank batteries, pumps, separators, and other oil and gas facilities that store, transfer, or treat EMP waste. The closure and decommissioning of equipment to facilities associated with produced water requires a Form 27 Site Investigation and Remediation Work Plan. Confirmation soil samples are required for decommissioning, for decommissioning facilities to demonstrate the absence of EMP waste. Here is a photo of a 10-inch produced water line spill release in Rio Blanco County. The red line on top of this flow line is a tracer, which is used to locate the flow line, and the stainless steel sleeve around the line is a repair measure. In this case, the operator performed a dig and haul to remove and remediate the impacts associated with this bill and release. Confirmation soil samples were collected to dem 
administrate compliance with Table 915-1. ECMC environmental staff conduct ins conducts inspections of these spills and releases to confirm that all impacts associated with the spill and release are adequately addressed. Here is another photo of a produced water spill and release that originated at a produced water pump that is utilized for moving produced water in and out of a tank battery. This spill occurred when a fitting on the pump froze and ruptured during a cold night, which caused produced water to be released outside of the pump building and onto the location. The operator performed a dig and haul to remove and remediate the EMP waste on location. Confirmation soil samples were collected to demonstrate compliance with Table 915-1. This is another spill and release that I personally inspected. This concludes our presentation. Thank you all for your time today. And Arthur and I will be available to field any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, thanks, Arthur, for being here to uh, answer questions on this. I thought it was a good presentation. Really appreciate that. Uh, I see Barbara's got a question. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, it was quite detailed. Um, my question has to do with the testing that's required to um, approve the, the haul and release or the remediation after a spill? Are you just testing for salts or are you testing for a more complete list of potential contaminants? Um, so 915-1, table 915-1 is the table that we use, uh, are the standards that we use for, uh, for cleaning up remediating EMP waste. That table contains organic compounds, which are your uh, TPHs, total petroleum, hydrocarbons, as well as BTEX, which is benzene, toluene. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also has inorganic compounds uh, that includes electric conductivity. And so that is a way of measuring basically a salt level within soils, as well as um, SAR P and pH. And then we also have the operator sample for metals as well. So it's organic compounds, inorganic compounds, and metals. But the organic compounds are the typical hydrocarbon-based uh, low to high molecular weight compounds. Um, are there any specific tests for um, components of fracking fluid, surfactants, um, biocides, et cetera? Those aren't specifically listed in table 915-1, um, but there are other tables within our series that we can have the operator sample for if we believe that those contaminants exist. To your knowledge, has that ever been required? Um, yes, because sometimes when these produced spills produce water spills and releases occur, um, the environmental protection specialists will have the operator to uh, collect a sample of the produced water in order to uh, characterize the waste. Is that based on the volume of the spill or you know, when do you decide to trigger that additional work? Um, we, it's a case by case basis. And no particular um, attribute that would cause you to trigger that? There are no uh, specific thresholds within the rules that, uh, that require that. Thank you. Other questions uh, for John or Arthur on what was presented? Well, John, you must have done a heck of a job because no one's asking questions about a very complex set of rules. But uh, uh, but appreciate you being here. Appreciate you providing us the information. Oh, Jeff has a question. Well, I, I just a comment. Thank you, Commissioner Jeff Carlo with TEP, and and I would just encourage uh, you know the members of the consortium to to really spend some time with these rules um, and and understanding 
what operators are subject to with respect to um, uh, a lot of this, uh, these requirements. Uh, John did an excellent job uh, of uh, explaining holistically how, how this really works from an operator's, from a, from a regulator standpoint. Um, and, and within each of these activities, uh, there's a lot of complexity, um, you know, particularly around things like water share agreements, which we uh, do a lot or historically have done a lot within the peon space and uh, due to the, the volumes of water that, that we have available. Uh, but again, just, just really understanding uh, the, the extent of, of rules that we are subject to as operators, I think is, is really important for, for members to, to really dive into it and have an understanding. Uh, a lot of the, the concerns and, and, and questions, and, and Barbara, I appreciate the line of questions with respect to spills. Um, you know, a, a lot, uh, I, I think a lot of the issues that are typically um, of concern uh, are, are really uh, understood when, when, you, when you review the, the level uh, of uh, scrutiny that operators are subject to within these rules. Uh, and certainly uh, from an operator perspective, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from, our, from our perspective. Thank you. Uh, Jacob? Yeah, just the same, Tessa and John, both, uh, thanks. Those were both really helpful presentations and appreciate it very much. Great, thanks for that, I agree. Um, Harmony? Oh, gosh, um, two things. First is I ran across an article and working for the on the legislation that talked about how it was a real game changer where it used to be a prohibition for operators to recycle, reuse the get or recycle um, the water to it being encouraged to it then going to sharing agreements and how that really was just the huge factor in the industry, just like what the previous speaker was saying. And so I just really want to extra add a highlight to that that there does need to be collaborations around these industries because that really does up the volume that people can pull from. And then it, it, the time crunches lessen. And so when operators are willing to do these sort of things, I think that really opens up things. But, and also more importantly at the same time is the concern about the open pits and how I personally, I think it's really important when they're close to someone, but I also think it's important when they're everywhere. And so I think that we really, really have to look at that and figure out what we are safe with and what we are comfortable for storage. And those two things I believe are the key for the success of um, actual active recycling of the water. Thanks for that, Harmony. I swear someone else had their hand up, but now I'm not seeing it, so. Oh wait, but I forgot point two since no one else is raising their hand. Oh, shoot, um, but. I also want to add that one of the things in talking to people who inspect for these sort of things is that it's it's easy to see an oil spill. You can smell a gas spill, but a produced water spill, a lot of times it's water that evaporates and you don't understand or know that there was a spill until there's a, a plume or things aren't growing there anymore or what happened in that vegetation or like Barbara was mentioning about roadside vegetation from de-icing. And at that point, you have to be reactive instead of proactive and you've already made a huge impact on the soil. And then I won't go on the rabbit hole of the other things that I heard once, <laughs> once we go there, but wanted to highlight that as well because I think it's really important. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Clay? Thank you, John. Uh, Clay Terry. This, uh, I'm sure we don't have time to deal with this uh, subject today, but I think it's, I think it's pertinent to uh, comment on the fact that we need to, I think, best better understand the implications of be, uh, produced water being labeled as an ENP waste, and what are the limitations uh, that that creates uh, relative to our ability to, uh, to utilize it uh, for oil field uses. Uh, as a means of, of reducing freshwater uh, use in the oil field applications. Um, it's a broad topic. It's, it's not something that can be resolved in this in the next 10 minutes, but it's, I think it's a, an issue of, of criticality that we understand what are the implications of that. Um, an example being some of the waters that we, that we uh, currently have here, even in Colorado, uh, produced water are 
essentially either below drinking water standards um, in terms of uh, water constituency, or they're cleaner than than some of the waters, the natural surface waters like the South Platte. Um, and yet they're not, you're not able to do much with them because of the implications of it being in the MP waste. And so I, I just think that uh, some addressing that issue for the consortium would be a worthwhile exercise, that's all. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Clay. I think that's um, that kind of ties into what I'm hoping to have a quick conversation on, but um, we're not going to have enough time to get in depth. But I, I do want to hear from folks about like next steps, right? And so I, I appreciate bringing up the topic. I've taken a note on the topic, and certainly happy to like try to figure out where that appropriately fits in, in future meetings as part of a conversation or as part of education or information that we need to develop and. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Tessa, do you have a thought? Yeah, I, I want to second that um, just because it is a, a very, very good point that I hadn't thought of. I also want to make sure that, um, let me lower my hand, um, that I think hydraulic fracturing fluid is, is really, really important to think about, but quantity wise, it is a drop in a very big bucket of volumes. Um, produced water, pulls from the, the active reservoir. And um, as I was talking to one of my colleagues, think a dump truck of gravel dumping one load on your driveway. That's, that's a frack job and how much water that is versus a conveyor belt depositing every day for 30 years. Um, that'll bury your house. Um, but the contaminants that could be in frack fluid need to be considered in that because it does actually go into the reservoir and therefore come back out of the reservoir. So that, that's what I want to, to note on that in terms of frack fluid. Okay, thanks for that. Um, do, do actually uh, don't wanna have the big debate right now. Do wanna hear about topics for future meetings. And so um, happy to hear from folks. Barbara, I saw you next. Uh, just quick to respond to Tessa, thanks for that. But uh, I did want to clarify that the, as I understand it anyway, the, um, speed with which the frac fluid and the components of the frac fluid return to the surface of that early flow back and produce water is different from well to well and basin to basin. And so I think it'd be pretty difficult to it would draw a line and say, now this is produced water and it, it, it's unlikely to have uh, significant concentrations of frac fluid components. So obviously a topic for discussion because there's some thoughts on this and I think it's important to have that discussion. So I've got it in the notes, Tricia. Yeah, just to jump on that also, um, with respect to chemicals, maintenance chemicals are used more often, more frequently uh, on production wells than hydraulic fracturing. Like I said in the presentation, there is an overlap. Um, but maintenance chemicals aren't pushed into the formation like hydraulic fracturing and just go down the well bore and could come back up. Unused portions of the chemicals could come back up as a slug. So just kind of throwing that out there. So thanks. Hey, thanks for that. Um, so understanding that we've got certain deliverables and certain timelines associated with those deliverables coming up and um, also being respectful full of folks' time and realizing we have two minutes left in the day. Um, I, I wonder if I could ask folks to just think a little bit about, you know, what, what topics are gonna be important for you to, to learn about, uh, to discuss, um, and, and to highlight as part of ongoing meetings over the, let's say the next six months as we look at uh, doing work towards different deliverables, for example, you know, today's presentations were really designed to start a baseline of knowledge so that as we look at, you know, deliverable due in May, we have a better understanding of what currently is happening in state and federal regulatory agencies uh, to be able to allow us to ask more informed questions um, about how those agencies could better work together uh, to encourage reuse and recycling, or, or, or maybe it's fine the way it is, but to at least give us that information. I think that like, the presentations today also feed into um, 
you know, some of the conversations we may have in the future about, you know, existing infrastructure associated with oil and gas or recommendations on infrastructure and technology that may need to be developed in order to encourage reuse and recycling and produce water. And so th these are the things that I'm trying to, to tee up is, you know, what is, what is some additional information we need? What are the specific conversations that you think would be useful to have? Um, what, um, you know, as you look at the deliverables over the next few months, what are going to be the most important topics for you? Um, and how would you like to approach those? And just start the conversation via email. If you want to send those just individually to hope, um, then that would, then we're not getting in the way of any kind of open meetings lab, but then that gives her the ability to start to compile it so we can begin the next meeting with a conversation around that. I'm going to be interested in having conversations around work groups and, you know, how to better break down the consortium into perhaps different topic areas so that we can have more specific or more targeted information or discussions about some of this stuff. Um, so I, I guess that's an ask. Does that seem like appropriate to make that ask and to have folks maybe provide some information from their perspectives to hope so that we can start to kind of set the stage for a discussion next meeting. And I, I saw there were some people that raised their hand, but now I can't see them. So if you have something to say, go ahead. Or not. Kevin. Kevin Chan. Um, yeah, thank you for for um, the last points. I, I, I guess for me as a consortium member representing community, um, is really talking about the economics of, you know, the, the value of a commodity that you like fresh water, right? Because everything does have a commodity value, whether or not we see it or not. Um, and really who controls, you know, the, these, these, these costs as well, right? Like we may say it's un, uneconomical to, you know, recycle, produce water if someone says that, but, you know, it, we when when we're trading fresh water um you know to put down hole and things like that i i i want to point out that you know eventually you know in drought in drought years right we 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 want you know that that fresh water is going to skyrocket in price and the produced water that we do have i mean what you know this is why i would like to see recycling um i i would not like to see um you know us having to pay, you know, an arm and a leg for fresh water as just residents. Um, so maybe some thoughts about that to get this, the wheel spinning. Um, but that's kind of what was on my mind and the health and safety impact of, impacts of um, recycling water, especially when we're going through, you know, different types of water basins and, um, you know, the pits and things like that. But right. thank you all for the presentations today. Thanks for that, Kevin. Thanks for your thoughts. I mean, that, that ends up being a topic of mine too. I'd love to hear uh, more information about water rights and um, and some of those, those topics that you brought up as well. So uh, I've got that down in my notes and appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I think we'll kick the rest of the questions to email uh, to hope. Really appreciate everyone's participation today. Let's give a... a, a a silent weird zoom round of applause to our presenters today and uh uh and uh i hope everyone has a happy holidays uh over the next uh few weeks and get the chance to um see family and uh uh we will catch up with everyone again in the new year so uh, thank you and don't ever hesitate to reach out to myself or to hope if you have any questions or concerns or have any thoughts so uh, have a good rest of the day and uh, we'll see you later thanks see ya